I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR, where we provide HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform and giving you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Josh Kotoff. Josh, you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be great. Josh is passionate about the numbers people don't understand. He leads in explaining simply and clearly, clearly what is the world, what is what in the world is search engine optimization, SEO, and what modern platforms like YouTube are doing with their current algorithms. A born leader, Josh has come from a self-made businesses to growing marketing departments and campaigns with national brands like Live Nation, Take a Master, A5C Bakery, and most recently, NBC Universal. NBC Universal. His specialty is SEO that helps businesses get the right audience and, and rank on Google, co combining his decade-long SEO knowledge with his film background. He also runs many YouTube channels as one of the top YouTube strategists, managing over 22 million views per month. Josh, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So Josh, we're going to talk about some of the first. First, you know, happy birthday. Today's your <laughs> yeah. birthday. Thank you. So you're like, you're 24 again, 20, yeah. 23 again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So we're going to drink some, uh, let's pour some couple of drinks real fast. Uh, of course. Thank you for the birthday yes. present and the Suntorky whiskey sponsorship. Obviously. Yes, obviously, obviously. Obviously. That is amazing. Thank you for this. Yes. Looks like we can have it neat. Yeah. I mean, that's your favorite anyway, right? Huh? It's one of them. Yeah. It's different. I like it. I'm free to pour anymore. Yes. Cheers, Cheers to you. Cheers to you. I'm more of a, I, I prefer rye the most, but the, the Japanese whiskey always just has a different. Yeah, it does. It, yeah. It's nice. So before we get started with our business, we're going to start some, some personal stuff. First, you're, you're pretty young, right? And from my experience, like, I didn't start drinking like real bourbon talk, like, like in my 30s or 40s, right? And the fact that you're past the Jack Daniel or Jim Beam stage at a such a young age, like pretty like fucking impressive, right? How did you like, you know, learn, okay. Jack Daniels is good for my high school. I'm not a high school student anymore. Let me upgrade my bourbon game, so to speak. Ah, well, uh, I didn't drink until I was 24. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, maybe it's just because I'm efficient. I look at Jack Daniels. I look at that and it's, I'm like, yeah, it's on the cheap brand. It's a good mixer, but it makes you feel bad. <laughs> and I just like the mid-range stuff like Bullet. But I didn't drink. I, I didn't drink till I was 24 because I have a funny story about that. I used to work a lot of events in Hollywood just paying the bills and then uh, doing event lighting and event management. They're just a lot of fun stuff. And we went to this really awesome Hollywood party and I'll probably never top this party. It was in Beverly Hills. They were having such a good time that Eddie Murphy was the neighbor next door and filed a noise complaint. And I met so many people that I don't even, I can't probably even appreciate for me. I met Angelica Houston. So that was nice. Met one of the Beatles. Um, and then at the end though, it was getting late at night and we were, we we're going to have to tear down in about an hour. So it was me, my friend's dad, Eric Idle, and Drew Carey. And Drew Carey came over with a bunch of drinks. And I had my first drink with Duke, Drew Carey. And that was a like pretty high end uh, American whiskey. And I was like, tastes pretty good. And I tried all the other ones. Nah, whiskey is my drink. I can sit there. And over the years, I just try different ones. Like, have you been to Canon up here? Yeah, yes favorite place hopefully i'll go for my birthday but uh man talk about breaking your uh whiskey virginity with drew carey I like that's the hell of a story <laughs> right who's your first pick? oh just drew carey you know no big deal yeah it's hollywood you beat a lot of people i guess but how many times do you get to actually share a drink with them in a relaxed atmosphere yeah not professionally I'm like so that that was fun and uh yeah i just appreciate a nice glass it's just relaxing and uh try not to overdo it yeah, I should like drink all the crap all the time, right? So somebody told me, let me ask you something, Jason. Um, you drink this crap, why not drink the better stuff, right? And then, of course, you get the better stuff. You like could Jack and Dan, you got to pour Coke in it, Jim Beam and Coke, right? So I, I thought of what it was, like kind of high in bourbon. I was going to pour, pour some Coke in, like, Jason, what are you doing? Are you going to, why are you going to ruin this, you know, $100 drink with a 50 cent beverage, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I didn't think about it like that, right? Yeah. And then the more high end you get, the less you need. And yeah. the more you savor it. Yes. Like I could buy a bottle of like a, one of my favorites is uh, High West Double Rye. Mm -hmm. And especially with the uh, alcohol tax up here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, terrible. Terrible. But so when I get it, that lasts me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a nice little pour, put on a movie, nice little nightcap on the weekend, like once a week. Oh, that it hits the spot. So wh why rye versus like regular bourbon or something else? Bourbon's too sweet to me. Is it? It's yeah, I, I really taste it. 
okay too sweet uh scotches i like to try a bunch of different ones uh my best friend wes has a more wide range of scotches mm -hmm. and me and him also just don't like the peaty ones okay. i can appreciate a certain level of peaty mm -hmm. but uh we went to this one whiskey bar and he's like oh yeah that sounds like from ireland i would like that mm -hmm. we got it and it was progressively more and more lighter fluid it just yeah tasted yeah like i'm not a big fan of charcoal yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan to of his either. credit he finished every single one like uh, a champion and i applaud him for that and he's burping up smoke the rest <laughs> of the night and he's like never again do you have a go-to bourbon or go-to whiskey uh if i'm at like the grocery store and mm. i don't want to spend on anything mm. too big i go to bullet rye okay yeah that's the full dependable one yeah yeah but if i have a budget i would go for a, like high west double rye yeah because in la there's a spar called seven grand mm. and it's super stupid fun where um you can buy a bottle mm -hmm. and then you pay for a locker to store it in and you make the label and everything what? so when you come come there it's all paid for mm -hmm. you just you're you're just tipping after that okay. so it's a nice place to impress people like nah, i already own something here and they go to locker and they bring yeah. it out i'm like it's so dumb but uh they have a special high west double rye edition that's aged in um i think it was in a wine barrel uh, it's like a white oak wine barrel and i haven't had a rye that was aged in a wine barrel mm -hmm. and it was very hot very very strong mm -hmm. but it had a really nice aftertaste it was a clean okay. burn and i just over the years i'm any any friend who's like what do i start with what, what whiskey do i start with i'm like you're probably not going to like the dark wood let's face yeah. it not a lot of people do uh a lot of friends ask me what's a good starter with uh, like scotch mm. and i always say glenn uh glenn live at 12. yeah it's smooth it's simple and then once you get the notes uh in the spring they make one that's like blue and white and it tastes like an orange creamsicle to me at least once you get past <laughs> once you can pick up the notes but i got friends who sit down they can open a bottle of wine be like ah, oh, yeah oak cherries <laughs> and i go yeah it tastes like red <laughs> you know it's like the wineries across Bainsbridge Island and everything. <laughs> it's like oh it's so good I'm like I kind of like this one a little bit better look at the legs I'm like look just get the whiskey yeah smell it if you have a dropper oh I want to taste the notes if not you just appreciate it yeah you don't shoot it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a sitting drink so I don't know if you're on TikTok or not but I'm on TikTok I follow this channel called uh I think it's called bourbon plug mm -hmm. and once a day this guy does like a um review of different bourbons right Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty interesting first of all i had no idea there's, there's so many bourbons across the world right there's a lot. he breaks it down like 20 above 40 above like this a case that case it's, it's very interesting right mm -hmm. so i need to find a bourbon that i like because I, and one that has less of a sugar content because mm -hmm. i understand why it's so much used in cooking and everything but i bet there's a lot yeah definitely yeah bourbon is definitely a go-to drink you know it's like the man's man man man's yeah. man drink is right you your know go -to? usually yeah awesome yeah yeah usually yeah. bourbon so next um Nothing, something else you do, my people not know you do. I don't know when the last time you did it. We actually go to shooting ranges quite a bit, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. My best friend's dad, he's an Eagle Scout firearms master. And at this point, it's a Christmas tradition to just take whatever guns they feel like from their little garage armory. And uh, we go out and uh, go to their private range out in the, at this one, in these, in these hills and just spend a few hours there. How, how long have you been shooting? Uh, I don't. I was going to get a lot more competitive at it before mm. pandemic and everything mm. closed down because then I was like, I have the money because I yeah. really want to get, there's a lot of long distance of ranges here mm. and I really want to get into that. Uh, just, it's, I have to bite the cost of buying an $800 scope. And that's one thing that people don't realize, like wherever your hobby is, it's going to cost money, right? Oh, even, yeah. even you say, well, I'm going I'm to be a runner, running races, right? You got to buy the shoes, a hundred dollars. You got to register for the races, you know? And then, you know, you people, <laughs> yeah. And then people don't count the time you're doing the hobby, right? You know, like, mm. you know, you might spend, 20 hours a week, you know, running or whatever, right? But right? well, that's 20 hours a week. You can't charge anybody for products or can't do it. So there's a cost benefit, cost thing too, mm -hmm. right? But hobbies, there's no such thing as a cheap hobby. Even like watch TV all day, you're paying for their TV, you're paying for cable or, yeah. you know, there's there's no such thing as a free hobby, I don't think, unless it's... Oh yeah, like people know me for like getting certain Legos or building Bionicles. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, that's a nice hobby. Like, you don't know how expensive these things are, man. Yeah. That's why I don't get too many of them, unless I'm building a collection. But, but yeah, it's... Uh, I, uh, we, we just kind of go out and shoot all the time and firearm safety is the number one thing. Oh yeah, definitely. And yeah. then I just, I just love learning and grilling it every time. And then, uh, this was the second time that I took my dad out there cause he never shot a gun before. Mm. And, uh, so he got a shotgun and I got a pistol. It's great. When I visit home, there's like 
a thousand rounds of ammo <laughs> next, next to my bed. I'm like, oh, so this is what my childhood room is. They're just <laughs> double O shotgun shells and a hollow. I thought, oh, this is overkill, but cool. Because he, he gets to drive out to like uh, New Mexico for work every now mm-hmm. and then, get some ammo while he's out there and come back. Because, you know, you can't find like ammo these days. Everyone's buying it up. No, that's people don't realize, you know, whatever you say about gun control, that's here or there. The thing is like the ammunition is like really controlling, right? Yeah. And uh, unless you're shooting so much, then it's the only, then you would make your own bullets and it'd be cost effective. But that's that's a lot. But I, I that's got some that's some ancient hundred shit right oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> I got to uh, take him uh, two years ago to shoot for his first time and he went through the training and he had fun. It was pretty interesting. And then especially when he finally got to shoot the shotgun, mm. we start with the basic 12 gauge mm. and then we're like, well, you brought the double all rounds. So might as well feel what that feels like. <laughs> And we got the bruised shoulders the oh, next course. day. I'm like, oh, of course, you got to right. be. You gotta tell them about that, the kickback and stuff. Oh yeah, it's fun. And they, you know, the, they just had like bowling pins. You shoot it, flies ten feet in the air. You're like, oh, this is fun. This is fun. And people, then, uh, yeah, people don't realize how fun that that shooting is, right? People, oh, I'm like, I'm gun control. People don't need guns. Oh yeah, because you got to. They don't realize how. Yeah, they realize how fun it is. Out of respect, you yes. recognize it's a tool, and you're the dangerous one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's the saying? I heard somewhere like. um, Guns cause murder like matches call cause arson or something like that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cars just as dangerous. So yes. So do you have a f- favorite weapon you like firing the best? Or uh, preference? I haven't got to try like the ones I really want to try. Uh, but there is um they have a bunch of cowboy rifles mm-hmm. and those are fun. Like he's got like the like the the 12 load one where you just put it in and you crank it. The, the uh, lever action. Lever action uh, one is really fun. There's a little single shot one that's fun. Uh, my friend Wes got me uh, a cowboy pistol. And he's like, look, this is baby's first gun. A revolver it has the smallest caliber. You probably can't fuck this up. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely and it. He's like, you'll, you'll be able to go shoot it at local ranges. It's going to be cheap. You're going to keep learning how to clean and do maintenance. And if someone breaks in well you're not going to blow out your ears or blow out your window so there you go i'm like that's true so i got a nice little long barrel cowboy revolver at home and they got me the little gun thing with all the keys <laughs> and i got to carve it out it's all secure and uh but yeah i'm looking forward to doing long range shooting and with my new job i'm gonna put some yes. money towards and that. so you go you only go once a year or you're gonna try to do more than that I, uh for the past two years it's been once a year okay i try to do a lot more but with covid stuff uh as you know marketing is the first thing that gets cut Mm -hmm. when when things get tight that's the biggest mistake you can't cut marketing because if you're losing business that's not optional you need to be seen you need to be discovered you can't rely on your regulars and unfortunately that's what happened during pandemic i went from managing about 12 clients to over the course of the first three to six months pandemic Mm -hmm. to three Mm -hmm. and after that i was just surviving on one-off jobs and helping out companies and i got creative i would go on Bumble business or Bumble BFF match with people and businesses <laughs> and be like, hey, what do you need this? I know I'm having trouble with this. I just ask the questions and I get to a conversation about their Google business page because that's the most important thing, especially during pandemic and regrowing right now if you have a physical business. And I just tell them optimizations. They're like, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, 100 bucks, I'll do it. Here's my Venmo. <laughs> and I crank four or five of those out a week just throughout the pandemic just Man, to that's stay great. afloat. That's great. Uh, I got to hustle. I can't be lazy. I'll, I'll be no. homeless. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> I got nothing to fall back on. That's a great motivator. Not be homeless. So next, and I mean this as a, as a compliment, you're like a super nerd, super geek. You do like <laughs> Bionicles, Star Wars, Comic-Con. Talk about that that factor, that that part of your life where you do all this stuff, like all that, you know, nerdy stuff, so to speak, you know, the Comic-Con, the Star Wars, the, how you said Bionicles, whatever Bionicles. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I'm a big nerd in the aspect of, I got very specific niches I'm in and the ones I, I'm in, I know everything. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's good to have your hobbies because Bionicle is one of my favorite things of all time. I've got almost all of them and I know the lore backwards. And so what, what is that? What uh, is it? It's a buildable construction figure from Lego. It's not Lego blocks. It's like joints and axles. So you have, it's a different form of building. So a different level of nerd. Yeah, different level <laughs> of nerd. And then people go, has a backstory. I thought they're like robots with masks that fight. I'm like, oh yeah, but also goes back like 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that, and then Halo, obviously, because right? I got the helmets, and, and also it's nice to know Halo's up here in Washington, mm-hmm. so that's cool. 
And then, uh, like, I know I love Mass Effect and certain RPGs, so I'm big fans of that. And working with what I do, I get to end up getting free passes to Comic Con or these video game events because I'm more like the marketing managers, or I am helping out a channel, and these people get panels and they're like hey do you want a free pass i'm like yeah and then i get exhibitor pass mm -hmm. me and my friend ian got to go to one of the bigger comic cons uh for voice actor stuff for lego and we were walking around that was a, a really fun time so how long you've been you knew this like said like for a long time what the nerd no, stuff yeah. forever the voice forever. acting as a hobby <laughs> yeah so next let's talk about the, the voice acting stuff you do you voice acting and plus you like writing some movie scripts i think yeah yeah i i because i used to work uh on set for uh warner brothers and uh just tnt pilots uh, i've got a few amazon pilots and things attached to my imdb i got a it's funny i got a uh, notification from imdb the other like last week they're like hey your profile is up ten thousand percent i'm like who the fuck is looking at me <laughs> and i looked and I, i'm like oh some of those projects that was attached to like four years ago finally got published cool all right Let's... And so this is like another revenue stream for you? Or is no, another no, hobby? it's a hobby. hobby. It's a hobby. Like it's an end goal because uh, I like to do SEO and all this marketing stuff because when you build the machine, after a while, it becomes not passive income because there's nothing, no thing, nothing truly passive unless it's mm -hmm. affiliate marketing, but it's lower maintenance. So mm -hmm. if I get an SEO strategy with a business and I perfect it, like within six months, I'm like, okay. And there's no immediate Google changes mm -hmm. or any algorithm updates. I can go, okay, for the next three months, the strategy is working. They're getting leads. They're getting good traffic and calls. Now it's maintenance mode. So it goes from, you know, like a regular work week to that one client. Now I only do four hours a week mm -hmm. on it just to check and do maintenance. And that frees up my time to do the things I want to do. I want to keep riding. I want to go out to the lake and kayak a lot more this summer. I want to work off my, my my little weight gain that i got over pandemic and uh especially now that winter is over and finally stopped raining yeah so how do you go about writing your movie scripts is it like the process you use or how do you go about doing that uh so in college i used to teach how to do writing scripts and uh because i had like warner brothers stuff i would um have a stamp that i could do craigslist stuff and have it sent to my friend's place who had like a p.o box associated with the company to review movie scripts mm -hmm. and movie ideas. And I learned um, mainly by just reading the worst things in the world <laughs> that doesn't, that don't make any sense. I've heard terrible ideas. I've read some interesting ones, but they fall apart. But um, for me, my talent is structure and formatting. So that's why I'm good at SEO. I'm a pretty good producer. And at, when coming to a writer, I know how to hit certain goals and marks. So if you're talking about a movie script, you would break it down to about 100 pages because a lot of people write it for their idea, but they don't write it to be sold. There's a big difference because when you're being an artist, you also have to understand that you are a business. You're yeah, artist. you don't want to be a starving artist. Yeah. I hope you don't want to be a starving artist. Can't romanticize that. And uh, so you got to approach it in the way of, it, you need to get your foot in the door because especially now with all online uh, like auditions, your competition is tenfold. You know, and so you have to stand out and you have to figure out how the agency works. When you write a script, let's say you did a hundred page script and you're proud of it. When you send it out to an agency or a studio, they give it two to three pages. That's it. If you go, oh no, it's good at page 10. That's the hook. I don't care. That, is, that poor assistant is sitting there with a hundred scripts a day. You, they can only give it three pages. If they get excited or slightly intrigued, they go to five. If they ever make it to page 10, you get a phone call. And then at that point, they'll either look at your film background, be like, hey, we like this. Can we buy the idea off you? Or if you're experienced, you can negotiate. Or they'll just straight up buy it and shelve it. And they go, all right, we either want this out of there as competition or we'll source this at a future date. But uh, yeah, when it comes to writing, man, I could just talk about that forever because there's a difference between TV pilots which I like to write more. Yeah. So what, what subjects do you prefer to write on? Like what, like, like comedies, like something. I'm really good at else? comedy just because I can just tangent and I laugh at my own jokes and I, I really like train wreck scenarios and I could just build that sort of chaos and make people go, ha, huh, that's a little concerning, but it's fun. <laughs> Socially awkward. Oh no. And uh, it, it's fun. It's fun. Cause the difference between movie scripts and pilot scripts is that for movie scripts, you get a world build, set the tone and like 
you're going into a movie for a sense of adventure or to be transported to a new place. TV is character based. Movie scripts, you'll have descriptions of like what the city looks like or what the shot's going to be. TV is a play. You show, you don't tell. And that's the biggest mistake in people trying to write TV scripts for their first time. You're just, you're, you're writing it like a movie script. You can, all you have to do is give a character description and move on. You have to show it through their actions. And I love going through TV pilots because it's so bare bones, but concise. You, ha you have to convey the characters and sell them. That's the idea of the show. Like um, the house pilot is one of my favorite examples. They don't like say his name half the time. It's just the words and the delivery. That's what gets everyone involved. That's how they introduce people. And then you got to figure out how to introduce people with context to create tension. And I, I just love that process. It's fascinating. And it's great to write the sit down to get these ideas, watch the characters play around in your head and just see what happens. I just love creating. So I always joke with myself. I stare at numbers all day. The words have to go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I get creative. So you might not know this, but for every every script that's accepted by TV or film, when I come here, or actually like put in, like is it like is a one percent acceptance rate, two percent acceptance rate? I'm guessing it's pretty low. I can't comment on the exact percentage, but uh, there's hundreds of scripts accepted, and then it's up to the showrunner or the executive producer to be like, nah, I like this one, mm -hmm. and, and they have all the power. And then since the show's accepted, you should have a pilot, and they say you shoot a pilot, it means it's going to go on TV. Yeah, so just because you shoot a pilot doesn't mean it's going on TV. Usually you lose money shooting the pilot because it's a gamble, but hey, you're employed for two weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> and in Hollywood, that's pretty good. So what's your goal with the writing the scripts and stuff like that? Just something fun to do or do you actually want to like break into TV? And I would a... love to break into TV and just be a writer or uh, be brought on to touch up scripts because I'm writing a book. I have a few ideas for other things. If it goes somewhere, I'd love that. But I'm just, nothing's going to stop me from creating. I just, my goal is I don't want to self-publish. I understand the process with the script background for the Hollywood agency works. Literary agencies, sort of similar, but more expensive because a lot of people self-publish because you'll write the book and then, all right, it's five grand for an editor, maybe another five grand to get a literary agent to find you interviews. And then once you're interviewing with, um, not studios, publishing houses, it can take up to a year to find the right one. And then when they're printing your book, that could be up to a year and then you get your first stipend and then royalties and depending on what happens there, it's a process. So not an overnight process. It is not. And then you got companies offering, well, we can make you 500 copies and you can throw it on Amazon right now. Mm -hmm. But that, that doesn't invalidate the book you wrote. I'm just looking at a long-term strategy. I'm looking for the, the biggest reach. I'm looking to get that bestseller. I'm not going to get a bestseller just by going on Amazon. No, probably not. No, I, I, can, I can optimize the shit out of my Amazon listing and do pretty well. Mm -hmm. but that's not what I want. Because then I want the publishing houses going. So you have a long-term plan. What else you got? You got a long-term plan. Then you get other. Yeah. And if it's becoming a, a bestseller, then you got studios, all the, all the digital studios, Netflix, HBO, anything like that coming to you going, we want to option this or pitch us your other ideas. Mm. Let's see if there's money here. And when you're pitching ideas, it could be as simple as they like the concept. You write up like a 10 page treatment on the story and they go, all right, we'll take it from here. Here's like a 20 grand. And you're like, okay. 20 grand for 10 pages isn't bad. <laughs> and uh, you, have to, you have to learn what ideas to separate yourself from. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who would love that idea. They're like, I need to make it. I'm like, take the money. Your foot's in the door. Take the money. There's always going to be more ideas. And you, everyone has that one idea they always want to make when they're growing up. Don't sell that one. Sell everything else and then build yourself up so you can make that specific idea. I like to refer it to like Tim Burton. There's some stinkers he makes out there, but every like two or three movies that his next one is a personal project. Mm -hmm. And then that's the one that everyone goes, Oh, he's good again. See, I'm like, yeah, cause you got to sell out a little bit and come back. It's just, no matter what you're getting, you're, you're going to find a way to make it your own. And that's always what's exciting to me. One of the writing tips I love to give is like, if you don't know where to start, just start, start parroting your favorite movie. Like not in a funny way, just like take inspiration from it. Even if it's beat by beat, you're going to start putting your own touches on it. And then within a while, you're going to make it completely your own universe. And that's how you do it whenever you have writer's block? Uh, no, when I'm writer's block, when I have writer's block, I'll do one of two things uh, or three. I'll read. That kind of helps. Um, but I'll read like the type of subject that I'm, wor I'm working with so I can get ideas for like the tone. Or I'll go for a walk or just know when to walk away from writing for a few days. Or I'll do a complete 
180 and uh, just write something cringy. I'll do like some really dumb fan fiction that I'll never publish that only I will understand. And I go, I still felt accomplished. I still felt creative. And it's really weird. And maybe you'll try something that you'll try writing something that you haven't tried writing before, whether it be fight scenes or some description, something like that. So how much, how do I put this? So of course, I you know they teach like English grammar literature in high school, college. How much, if, if someone has like a college degree in English, how, how much does that really help them being you know, like a writer, so to speak? Uh, I think it's pretty good because they, they have the structure for it mm -hmm. and they're used to it because all they do is write, especially in college. Um, I can't say how it attributes to going as a career as an author, because no matter what, you don't have to be an English major or anything. If you want to write, you're going to write. There's never going to be the perfect time to write. You can't always just say, I'll do that when I get my job, or I'll do it when I get a new desk, or, oh, when I move here. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. it. Everyone's at their own pace, but no matter what, if you're going to create, it's going to come out of you. So next, talk some about your, what your voice acting that you do also. Because you actually, no, you, you have actually like a voice booth in your house, right? Uh, well, I have to take that down. So do I'm you? Okay. One. Yeah, they, okay. they redid all the electrical circuits oh, okay. in the building. And they're like, you can't store anything flammable in the closet. It's a closet. <laughs> what do I do? So that was annoying. Uh, but I'm rebuilding a portable booth. Like how you got some of the walls mm -hmm. here. I'm just doing that or like a, a, or getting soundproof curtains mm -hmm. that I can make. But uh, I do it more on the side as a hobby because I need to get some of the equipment and I'm investing in that a little bit more. What kind of voiceover do you do like for TV shows or you actually make money off this? Uh, just, no, I don't make money. My, my, uh, my good friend Ian, he's a really good voice actor. He does commercial and he does, um, uh, I believe he's auditioning for animation stuff too. So mm -hmm. if uh, any businesses need online ads, he'll do it for, for good, for cheap. Well, not cheap, but better than whatever the other people he'll are. He'll do it good. He'll do it good. I want to support him. I'm his, I, I rival his agent in a way. I, we have a fun little joke that like, who's going to get him next <laughs> job first? But um, yeah, he, he does all the real stuff. I just kind of do fan projects. And then if YouTube videos need a voiceover mm -hmm. or a narrator or something, they'll pull me in. And I do like Transformers projects and Mass Effect projects. So it's just a lot of fun. So next, let's talk about social media for a while. What I'm gonna do now is like, I'm gonna go through each social media one by one. And you give me, I want you to tell me like, you know, if it's up and coming, people should be on or not be on it, you know, just for your take on it, take okay. on it, right? Yeah, I, I do it all in a practical sense and also how annoying it is. Cause I know TikTok is exploding. I find it very annoying, but also I'm not on it right now because I know I will create content <laughs> for it and I'll get lost in that rabbit hole, but I optimize <laughs> for it. So like, uh, my, my, again back to voice acting my friend ian uh, every now and then he'll create something he's like hey what tag should i use and mm -hmm. i use my tools and i look everything up and then he puts it up and he goes yeah i woke up next day it's got like thirty thousand views how's how's that happen i'm like seo <laughs> yes yeah just give your opinion one so first one is linkedin depends on your business goals mm -hmm. who's your market if you're b2b then yeah you need to be on there but it's LinkedIn is hard because it's an echo chamber because yeah. everyone's trying to sell. Everyone's trying to do things. And, and what's hard about LinkedIn, like you like you accept the LinkedIn requests within seconds. You get automated this, message. Auto you, everyone has like it. this 20 and it's like this 20,000, 25 font, single space. Why you should buy from me? And, and, and one thing I learned, like if you respond, it, 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 it breaks the sequence and you know to respond back to like a real person, right? So you don't respond to you just come going. But then like well, one time I told them I was interested. Someone was trying to sell like in-house, like, in like outsource software development. Well, I already have a team, you know, well, I'm sure you do, but I, can, I promise you my team is better than your people. You're like, I'm already invested in them. Right? Like, 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 why are you trying to sell? Like really, like how are you gonna tell me you're better than my people, right? Like, you know, it's yeah. just, yeah, LinkedIn is like, I don't know. I love it and I hate it too, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's, it's more for specific niches, like uh, especially when you're running ads. <clears throat> so I work with Live Nation and if we were to run a campaign for like the new, a new season's coming up where people usually hire keynote speakers mm -hmm. for like conventions. We would set a ad and target a certain job position, which would be like the receptionists and event managers and event coordinators. And then we'd be able to push our talent to them because we're solving a problem mm -hmm. through that. We're not just trying to connect and like, you know, like people go, do you post on LinkedIn? I'm like, no, 
I barely even update it. Yeah. I I hate it. Well, actually, you probably you probably know this, but the last time you posted anything was like six years ago. Oh yeah. And I had yeah. to go and like redo part of my resume because the um my job interview was like, hey, uh, link us your LinkedIn. I'm like, oh, I don't like that. Yeah. My my picture is old. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just gonna fill this in, copy paste my other positions, and mm. look at my resume. Don't look at LinkedIn. Yeah. But it, it's it's a yeah. thing. But if you really want to do business networking, I think the best thing you can do is like a WeWork or joining mm -hmm. your uh, local business bureau mm -hmm. or yeah. chamber of commerce. One time I looked out, I've met a lot of great people on LinkedIn. So I got a and of course, you know, I have access to LinkedIn live. So I kind of, so it's, it's, yeah, it's good. But yeah, it's like I said, I love it. And I hate it. Right. Just, yeah, it has its ups and downs and you got to slog through some of the automated features, but when there are genuine people up on there and they're all yeah. trying to reach out, it's just when someone sold everyone that one tool that can automate things, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to a robot. Yeah. So next, let's talk about Facebook. What's your take on that right now? It's in a transition period because Facebook business is nearly completely useless right now unless oh you throw God. five bucks on a post. Yeah. Uh, they're doing or, some... Unless you're Kanye West or, you know, P. Diddy or, you know, yeah. some big time person. And the fact that they connect everything now to Instagram mm. works, but it doesn't work because Instagram's going great, which I'm sure is the next platform. But um. Post frequency affects Facebook the most. Mm -hmm. And on Instagram, one of the main things you got to do is post almost every day. And if that's auto sharing to Facebook, if I log into my Facebook and I see this one person posting every single day, I'm just going to mute them mm -hmm. or I'm going to unfollow that page. It's very, it's very tough to find that fine balance on Facebook, but I don't even know what the. And then if Facebook, is there, is there like folks for your family, supposed to be like business, you know, there's all this stuff out there to you know. Yeah. Cause I kind of treat all my social media pages as just business mm -hmm. so it doesn't really affect my life or control it i don't really have any stake in it like i love to post things on like my instagram stories because that's just like fun things i see or things mm -hmm. i'm doing but then you know that you'll tune in you're like oh he's eating here he's having mm -hmm. a fun time here and oh now he's talking about youtube again yeah and then uh, i'm always selling or always just sharing my expertise on whatever platform i'm on not because i like i want to sell but because I love to teach. I love mm -hmm. to speak. I'm always encouraging other people to learn about this because there's so many people paying for like these giant Ty Lopez courses <laughs> and uh, they're full of shit. And you can get all the information you need about everything by Googling it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you got to sift through all the bullshit. So next, like two part Instagram and also IGTV. I don't know what the hell they're doing with IGTV. <laughs> it, was, it was like, it's longer videos now. All right. Does it show up anywhere? Not really. No, it's a separate tab. and. I guess it's it's like our YouTube. I don't know anyone who uses IGTV. I I, I can barely find the tab for IGTV mm -hmm. half the time. But uh, Instagram is definitely needed for a business, um, especially if you're product facing. The problem is, it's intensive because you can't just take a selfie and post it. You need to learn how to make waterfall content. Like you, you have these long episodes. And then you take the highlights yeah. and you post that out. And that's one of the most important thing to do. And it doesn't click with a lot of people because they go, oh, that's a lot of work. Like, yeah. And then the next part, <laughs> exactly. Is, things have to be aesthetically pleasing. You either got to take a good photo or get a learn graphic design or hire someone who knows graphic design or go to like, you know, Canva or all those free ones. But there's a fine line between what's affordable and cheap and what looks like a generic stock image. Yeah. And because no matter what, we can tell what's a stock image. Yeah, and, and through a Canva, like you know, it's easy, but it's not right. Like, like the other day, I was having a challenge, like changing like square picture to circle picture. I could not figure out for my life what it was. I finally asked someone, "Oh, is this? this? Is oh shit, that's it? You know, like so simple, right? But I couldn't figure it out for to save my life." Yeah, and it's it, Instagram stuff, just because you need to get that aesthetic quality, and it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be flattering to the eye, and not look like a stock image exactly. You could use it as a base, but you know work on your branding, work on all that. And that's a lot of territory that a lot of people don't know how to do. And it can get expensive fast and the amount of things you need to make for it. So like a good posting strategy on Instagram is about three times a week. Mm -hmm. I tell people just don't post on uh, Fridays because that's the lowest traffic day. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday is the highest traffic day along with Monday and Wednesday for Instagram. Sunday, especially significantly, because that's the day when everyone did all their fun stuff <laughs> over the weekend. And now they're look, catching up in bed and looking at everyone and interacting. How important is hashtags on Instagram? I'm trying to figure that out because in the just up until like six months ago, you were at like 15 hashtags was really good, but now they want less. They want five to seven. 
some, some even say three to seven. And um, it's because I think they're shifting over from the hashtag strategy to the tech strategy. And that's what I like a little bit more. So the old days, you would put your hashtag in the middle of your sentence if it was that word. Mm. But now they have the technology where it reads the caption and then you don't have to hashtag that word in the sentence. It will still be counted as that hashtag. So that's why front loading your descriptions above the fold is important. So like the first 60 to 90 characters show up as a caption. And that's why you need to put in your first two or three keywords in there organically in the sentence. And it has to make sense because uh, these robots are starting to understand what grammar is. They're not perfect, but they will understand if you just put all the hashtags in a row, like with, with commas, mm. and, the, and you know it's not a grammatical sentence. You can't just copy paste everything mm. on there. They'll know. But um, does it help you tag someone in your Instagram posts? Only if they have a lot. Uh, if you tag them in the photo, yes. And then uh, okay. if you're doing collaboration, obviously they always got to add it to their story mm -hmm. and you need to have a few hashtags that line up so you guys can refer each other traffic, it, whether it be on the home feed or the search function. And then um, a good strategy is you get your giant list of keywords or hashtags that you look for. And there's a lot of these hashtag generators, generators and they're all not that great. Honestly, you just have to learn how to eyeball it. You'll search that hashtag find the top posts, look at like the top five, be like, okay, these are repeating. They have this many views, this, this many likes. Is that because their profile's big? If not, you go back and you go, okay, uh, is it because the description is long? Is the description too short? Well, how are they front loading the description? And then you just start to average it out. And then you find out more hashtags from them. And you'll see a lot of people will do a solid paragraph because that's what's important. Uh, Instagram loves storytelling and writing a solid paragraph with a nice intro hook with those keywords is important then at the end you would throw in three to five hashtags and then the next day or two or so a day or two later you would go and comment the next series of three to five hashtags mm. to give it another visibility boost so to take a break basically it seems like you know you almost need a full-time person for linkedin full-time person for instagram you need someone's a full-time person for each social media of course no one can afford that unless you're getting a check so how does one like, you know, manage themselves or like get the right person, you know, cause a, lot of, cause a lot of college interns, they're like, I'll, I'll use social media for you. Okay. And they'll just focus on Instagram, do nothing else. Right. So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you recommend people work through that? Oh, one last thing about Instagram. I'm so mad because right now Instagram posted uh, is, is promoting and preferring short videos a lot more. So people are posting images as five minute video clips. So you'll click on it and you're like trying to read it and it goes away, but it has an impression rate of like, Three million people, oh. but you can't read it, and it, it infuriates me. So, and friends who get so fake, so, fake, so fake stats then. Yeah, yes, it's just like on Facebook where they stopped wanting to promote images as much, so people just turned to images and kind of animated it with like an effect, and then everything went a lot farther. But it was still annoying to see. But uh, so when it comes to a social media manager, it is tricky because you don't need someone for every single platform and a good social media manager can work on all the platforms and understand how to lay it out because it all comes down to waterfall content. You don't need unique content uh, for the media side for every single platform. You're really just changing up the caption every now and then. And there's plenty of schedulers like Sproutly and um, like, do you use one of the social media schedulers? So I used to use SmartIQ, then then money got tight, so I, I got rid of it, and I'm, yeah. I'm doing it, I'm posting everything on my own. And one thing, like, I, well, maybe I didn't find out, but like, some people say if you like, a, if you use like a like a SmartIQ or Buffer or Sproutly, or whatever case, maybe a Hootsuite or what a HubSpot, that you're gonna get a whole lot less. Like, um, you do a whole lot less. Yeah, you do. they want you on your platform. Um, I rather build uh something in like FreeCamp is free. It's a or Asana is the you know paid version mm -hmm. of just content task calendar yeah. and as long as you're organized it's not going to really affect you or yeah. so you just basically have a document that would just list the dates and then what caption yeah. goes that's, where that's what i'm doing yeah and uh, only back. challenge for me is like you know you'll mm -hmm. have this content plan or whatever mm -hmm. so you say you can say i'm gonna post something at 1 p.m on you know tuesday and then I have a meeting at 12 o'clock my meeting goes from 12 to 2 instead of ending at 12 45 so now yeah. you know gotta you know yeah in a perfect world it's all copied or preloaded uh some some platforms have scheduled posts and that's mm -hmm. a lifesaver because it doesn't affect it because you're 
on the platform. You're not using a third party app, but um, it really comes down to a waterfall strategy. Mm -hmm. You're going to create when approaching social media, you're going to create a, ba a base level of posts per month, mm -hmm. and then you're going to mix and match where they go. Just because this one graphic is going to go out doesn't mean it goes out on this on the same profile on all profiles at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can space that out. So on Instagram, you might post this one image, then four days later, pops up on LinkedIn. Four days later, it's on Twitter. And that's happening, staggered effect for all the content. So if someone's following you on multiple platforms, they're seeing you post different variety. They're going, man, he's professional. These guys are on top. Also, if uh, you're trying to grow all accounts and if someone's a fan of you or they want to support you, you're going to annoy them if everything looks exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And if you're posting the same thing on all platforms, what, why would anyone follow you on multiple platforms? So it's just hard to get that schedule because once you start posting. I mean, it is complicated. It's not easy, right? It's yeah, like, it is not. It's, not it's easy. so easy. Like, like, you know, let me send this picture of, of whatever, you know, at the same time because all platforms are right. It says one, one click is done, you know, don't it's worry easy. about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you said, it's, it's like more work to do the right way, so to speak. Yeah. Because then you're good. A good social man, media manager would keep an eye on that content per channel and then track the analytics and know what each metric is being performed at what day and what particular times, because it could, I'm not saying you need to post at different times mm -hmm. per day. It's a lot simpler if you go like, all right, it always goes up at like one because we know the audience is the most active. And like for a lot of YouTube stuff, we post at noon because that's where most of our audience is on the Pacific coast. And then it'll do really well. And then by the time it gets to the off hours on the East Coast, our audience there is watching. So it gets another bump. And then that bump keeps going until our international audience wakes up. And then they'll finish off the view count. And that's our first 24 hours. So it's trying to figure out how to keep your momentum going. And the hardest thing is always figuring out when is the best time to post. Not exactly just what the content is. That's a whole other thing. But when is the best time to post? Because you need to... You can't just post, uh, oh, hey, uh, on Tuesday, I posted at 2. On Thursday, I posted at 1. On Friday, I posted at 10 a.m. Uh, I guess uh, 10 a.m. works better than all of them. Like Different days of the week, different. You got to average it out. I'm a data guy. It takes time. So you would post at like noon throughout the entire week, usually two weeks, and see, all right, here's my core numbers. The topics didn't vary too much. So I feel like you look at the analytics go, ah, I feel like the audience is a little active a little bit later. So move it by two hours. So the next two weeks, you post that like three now. And then you start to see what the engagement is. Is it growing? In the first week, you'll know, oh, yeah, maybe it's less. Let's not do that. Then you'll change the time and it's averaging it out. It's too easy to press all and just post all at noon. That's not true strategy. And a lot of these college kids that are coming out doing social media, they're not posting as a business or a brand. They're posting like they normally post. Mm. They grew up with Instagram and Facebook and wow, I sound old, but, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're just in the mindset of like, oh no, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, or, or a lot of them at least. Uh, there's a lot of smart people who understand, oh, this is an algorithm tool I can use. And a significant amount of them too, unfortunately, buy online courses like Ty Lopez that gives them the roadmap. And that's gray and all but it's completely useless because you're paying for faking it till you make it, but you have no experience to back it up. So when something goes wrong in the algorithm, whether it updates or there's a client issue, you can't look at what you bought, the roadmap, and there's not gonna be a box that says, oh yeah, when Instagram does this, watch out for this. It's like, no, they laid out everything that should happen in their successful experience, but they don't give you the golden nuggets of what actually led you there. And I think that's that's one of the, shortcomings that a lot of people have the next twitter so twitter i think twitter is successful like there's a lot of trash in there however comma like all the hr people are on there all the fun all the vcs and you know fundraising people are on there you know so just like there's, there's, there's crap and there's great stuff on there how can people use twitter better you really just got to engage the audience because twitter started out as just a coupon platform and automated tweets but if you're tracking your industry, it becomes very niche. It's good to have some scheduled tweets in general just to keep the accounts active, but it's the type of one where you definitely have to plan out your posts and they're not just simple tweets. You 
have an engaging post that poses a question or offers a solution. You put the little number like one out of three or one out of four, and then you provide, you post question, provide value, provide value, sign up link or whatever product you're pushing. So a lot of people are like, I only tweet once a day for the business. I'm like, nah, you gotta, that one tweet probably gonna be like six tweets because Twitter is only engagement. That's the only way to get the visibility, not just tagging other people, but posing questions inside these spaces and seeing who bites. Like money-making Twitter is probably the best like example of that. People who are trying to sell their crypto courses or their uh, health and fitness courses, stuff like that. You can take one look at those and template it right then and there. Yeah. They're all, they all post exactly the same thing in the same format of issue, question, opinion, a stance. Here's what I think. Here's the solutions. Here's the value proposition. Here's what I need. Are you facing this too? Here's that. And it sounds generic, but it's Twitter. You're also Twitter too. <laughs> you'll see like, you know, people will post something and you'll see like anywhere from 300, maybe a thousand replies within that Twitter mess. People talking back and forth, replying like it's very high engagement, you know? It is. It is. And it, it is a craft. And the best part is Twitter, you don't really need images. No, you don't. You don't. You, like it helps in the beginning because if you're ever linking to something, if you do a Twitter post and then put the image, you'll usually have some higher impressions. And then below that, you should comment the link of what you're linking to. Because if you link to what you're, if you put what you're linking to in the first tweet, Twitter kind of suppresses it mm -hmm. because they don't want you leaving the site. Mm -hmm. You put it as a comment, it'll go far. So that's funny. So I took part of this LinkedIn content creators program one time, right? And of course, everyone says that, you know, if you put like a YouTube link or I saw a link on LinkedIn, like LinkedIn suppresses it. But according to all the people on LinkedIn content creators program actually worked for LinkedIn, they all said, no, that's not true. We actually support it, right? I think it's an unspoken policy. Uh, I do too. So we were like, okay, why? Yeah, it just didn't sound right, you know? Just always always put your main links in the comments. Just play the algorithm. Everyone's going to be posting it in their description anyways. Go 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 outside of the box. Okay. Put, put it in the comments. In your comments, cool. And then uh, keep an eye on the analytics. You know, maybe they're right, but... I don't trust the algorithms. Yeah. I, I live in the algorithms and I don't trust them. So next, next uh, social media, something like, you know, like had a meteoric, meteoric rise for a couple of years. Everyone's on it. And now it's like, it's like, like no one knows what's going on at like clubhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's come back. It's uh, it's an interesting platform, especially for the invite function. I don't know enough on how to optimize it because it's more of discovery mm -hmm. and value. So I think if you're just able to create a lot of, different types of content and keep putting it up there and be consistent. If people like to watch you, cause they're, look, they're there for your personality. They're not there for your brand or your solutions. When it comes there, I think it's more of a personality issue. I, I definitely agree. Clubhouse definitely more personality. Yeah. The thing with Clubhouse, like it, it was good at first, you know, I think it made some mistakes. Like first it's only iOS, maybe anyone in the rooms. I think they need like limit the rooms, right? Cause I've been in rooms like maybe a thousand people, like, you really can't talk and the people like talk over each other. It's like, this yeah, has been a problem. It's, it's a design error or they'll be like, oh no, you have the admin controls. I'm like, well, yeah, that's buried like three menus deep. Yeah. Come on. It's like Twitter has spaces and yeah. yeah. Plus everyone copy clubhouse too, you know? Oh yeah. Immediately. Twitter spaces are, is at least better because they can click on who's going to talk and yeah. invite. Yeah. So it's not one of those zoom meetings that have 50 <laughs> people in it. And you're like, I just, why am I here? <laughs> so next let's talk about TikTok. What's your view on TikTok? It's, it's the future. Uh, not exactly that TikTok's going to be around in like five years and the number one thing, but it's changing things. Because first off, it's exploded as a different type of influencer format. Vine was my preferred thing because, you know, seven to nine second videos, fun comedy skits and punchlines. TikTok is interesting because it's everything I ever wish I had when I first started Snapchat in college. Yeah, you know what? Is, my, my, my opinion is that TikTok is what Snapchat should have become. Yeah, it has all the video editing features, mixing, in-app editing techniques. Like, that's amazing. I remember having to, like, you'd have to, for Snapchat, if you wanted music, pull down your music player, start playing it, then bring up the snap and hope it lines up with what shot you're trying to get. And now Instagram's like, oh, just add music. And TikTok's like, oh, yeah, we got that song. What do you want? So it, it's the future. They upgrade, they up to their video limit to 10 minutes. I saw that. I, I know a lot of people I don't know why. Yeah, everyone in TikTok is like, we're not doing this. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I think, I don't know. I don't know why. I think maybe it's just to like 
experiment on what's going to be yeah. watch time. Yeah. Because the future of TikTok is micro content. Yeah, definitely. Micro meaning under three minutes mm. now. Micro used to mean Vine, like nine to seven seconds. But uh, TikTok mm. is really interesting because it's it's hard to optimize because their discovery tool is so tailored to your searches, mm -hmm. which is great though. So if you go into a niche, you're going down that rabbit hole for yeah. a while, then you search something else completely, then introduces you to a whole new area. But uh, like to go through TikTok, it's kind of like the same rules of Instagram. All these things are gonna have the same rules. Within the first sentence or two that's above the fold, you gotta put your main keywords in mm -hmm. it. You got it. And then to my knowledge, there's no immediate number of hashtags that you yeah, can I don't, I don't think, yeah i don't think there is so i just do five to seven because mm -hmm. anymore is just getting yeah overkill added. yeah you, you want something you can track because a lot of people will post like excuse me like on instagram they'll do like 20 hashtags like great it got a, more likes than i ever thought i'm like okay which one worked mm -hmm. and they're like what do you mean tell me which hashtag worked and the analytics don't tell you no they just tell you went far and that's why working with social media stuff You'll have your core hashtags, the ones that represent your brand, your category, your niche. And then you'll start adding on to that. You will like, uh, I work with a pottery account that I love and I'm trying to get famous. So we'll have like all these main, main keywords that we know Then we start trying different categories, like the type of clay or the type of pot or what type of genre it's from. And then we get to track what's growing and what's not working. And that's, that's my job for that. But, um, for TikTok, yeah, keep the hashtags simple and you'll get discovered. And there's so much traffic on there. It's just, it's free traffic because it's tying into YouTube a lot because people on TikTok have um, the, the link tree most usually yeah, in their tree, bio. Yeah. And <clears throat> a lot of people don't have good link trees. You need a clean one. You don't need more than five options. If I have to scroll on your link tree, I'm not reading it. I'm just, I'm and not. I know a lot of people like literally like hundreds of links on there. Yeah. I'm like, no, you, you put, if there's a sponsor or an affiliate link, that's at the top. And then you put then either your main site or your main social media you're trying to, trying to push people to. And then after that, if there is an extra link, great. If you're an artist, you put on Ko fi or coffee or Patreon or some donation type of thing. Um, but TikTok is changing things because of the way we're consuming content. Because YouTube created YouTube Shorts in response. And YouTube Shorts is really interesting in itself because they're um, under one minute videos mm -hmm. that autoplay and don't count against like your upload schedule. Because one of the things about YouTube is if you post too frequently or like one video does really bad, mm -hmm. it's not going to carry over the momentum to mm -hmm. the next video because then YouTube goes, oh, well, obviously no one liked this. So mm -hmm. we're going to wait till they stop not liking your channel. So mm -hmm. they let you wait for a few days mm -hmm. and so you lose your momentum but shorts don't affect that momentum they're okay. like in their own independent category so the way tiktok is going i'm ex i'm extremely curious to see what the future of short content is because short content allows discovery it's easily digestible it's easily consumable and most importantly shareable if i send you a, a thing that's 40 seconds long or like a one minute tiktok yeah, you got, you got time to watch it. Yeah. I send you a 10 minute YouTube video. It could be the best YouTube video you've ever seen. You look at it and go, oh, that's not right now. Yeah. People don't realize like how long it is a three minute video is, right? To make to actually make a three minute video, it's a long time, right? Because, you know, three minutes is a long time to talk. I don't think a lot of people realize that either. Oh, yeah. And then you just got to find the right way to engage. That's why like meme accounts are always great. They'll do like 15, 20 minute videos, but the content is changing every four to five seconds or, 10 seconds stuff like that funny videos just stitched together it's like fail compilations mm -hmm. you keep what you go oh yeah oh this one's only 20 minutes it doesn't feel like 20 minutes you just watch 100 people fall down and you're like that was great next one yeah I tiktok is definitely a black rabbit hole so to speak you know yeah but um just the way the format is going i'm very curious to see how this is going to affect discoverability because that is what is needed on a lot of these platforms i think we can all agree that snapchat has the worst discover function just because again in the beginning to see someone snapchat to be invited to their friends list that was exclusive that was fun that was the old school facebook style but when they went super public and it was everyone was popular you got to find more people throughout the world and they did a shit job at that and like i don't even use snapchat these days that much like i'll i'll post occasionally on it 
because it's like, oh, that's yeah, from my camera roll, but I'll have downloaded it from Instagram mm-hmm. to put it up. And then and I'll just look through my Snapchat memories. I'm like, oh, I was happy this time. Cool. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. TikTok is like, I think it's a fun platform. Like there's so much stuff on there. You know, like I follow one person, like 65 years old. He's got, he gives like a mental health tip, you know, another person, Leslie Vanessa gives self tips, you know. Mm-hmm. There's so much great stuff on there, you know. And of course, there's trash on there, like any social media platform, you know. Oh, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I like it a lot, you know. And then go to, go to Snapchat, right? I'd be so bored with Snapchat. I used to use Snapchat all the time. But like you said, it's just so unuser friendly now. So, like, you know, like, for example, if I take a photo before, I would take a photo and be able to like immediately post it on um, on Snapchat. Now the photo's not even the Snapchat camera no more. I gotta wait, wait a few days, you know. So it's just, it's just crazy how un. Un- it was so unintuitive Snapchat has become over these past years, you know, like mm-hmm. they'd, be, they'd be like the number one platform, number one this. And then I don't know, they got too much of the VR and lenses and AR or mm-hmm. lots of customer focus. It's, it's like, and of course, like Instagram copied them, you know, pretty much all everything, you know. So I just think Snapchat missed so much opportunities. Like, like I said, to me, TikTok is what Snapchat should have been. Yeah, but they started the trend of disappearing content. And that was a really nice engagement. Here's one for you. Tell me you agree or disagree with it. And you might be too young for this. Mm-hmm. So back when I was in school, we were passing notes back and forth, right? A piece of paper, right? Like I would pass a note yeah, to, I know to someone. Is. Yeah, I, yeah. I know <laughs> <laughs> you pass a paper note and the person like tear up and throw it away, right? To me, Snapchat was the same thing, right? You pass yeah. a note digitally and they would tear it up, you know? So basically the same thing, I think. Yeah. And it was great because especially on Snap, because we met through Snapchat. Yeah. Yeah. And it was such a fun way to meet people because first off, we had to be in the same circle. And yep. then there was those Snapchat databases, which made it curated. There was a curated list. Mm. Me as an SEO guy, I was like, oh, I know how to optimize this. And I got to the number four vlogger on the plot on that, on that uh, ghost codes database. Yeah. Ghost code. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, this is easy. I just do this. And then I had a bunch of people watching me and um, it was great because if I had people tune in every day, because they didn't want to miss what was happening. Yeah, you used to get a lot of great content on Snapchat. I guess it's oh, yeah. just be great to follow. I have all of it backed up and I'm like, well, I want to share that, or at least convert it into audio mm-hmm. because people are like, oh, look how young and skinny you are. I'm <laughs> like, it was like six years ago. And <laughs> shit happens, okay? I got sad. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what they did with Snapchat. It's like, but, but still a billion dollar company, I, I guess they're doing well, you know. Yeah, they got to do something. They added Snap Wallet and stuff. So sex workers are having a great time with that. Snap lenses. Snap lenses are, yeah, they, they started with Snap lenses and the Instagram filters got the, like they're still doing, making waves. It's just, I don't have any incentive. And I think yeah. it's kind of went full circle back to its like original purpose, which is kids sharing nudes. Yeah, so, I mean, I post on I once. Say I, kids. I, I mean, college kids. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> yes. I post that once in a while. It's crazy. I have a, my cousin has a son, Kale. He's like 17. Mm. I communicate with him on Snapchat. Yeah. It's that's, just, pretty, that's pretty much the only reason. I, I, commu- I, I communicate with him and another niece, you know, so, but mm. do I do it day to day? Like it just, Snapchat was just so disappointing for me, right? It's like, had so much. And like, I used to do a thing on Snapchat where like, I would upload my video and, and do like something called Pixel Editor mm-hmm. and use like a snap code, right? Mm-hmm. But some reason... The pics it doesn't work anymore so it's too hard to make an image on there so it's like that goes away and one thing i do like still like you can like make an image or take a picture and attach like a url to it you know yeah that was so pretty you can, good so you can still do that that was pretty good i also like when they added the the cut the sticker function yeah so like you know remember you know i got my little blue bar with my little yellow mm-hmm. yellow haircut on it and you know you, just, you create that asset put it on transparent background upload to your camera roll cut it out it cuts out the negative space and now you got that sticker that you can brand things and then I, every now and then I still feel messing me going, is that a filter? How'd you get your own filter? Yeah. How'd you do that? I'm like, oh, no, it's a sticker. But yeah. also I miss when you, I, don't, I think they raise their prices, but if you picked a low traffic area when you can pay like 10 bucks for the yeah, hour. Yeah, I, 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 I do miss that. The filter, like, you know, that like, was fun. Like, like, you know, you know, you know, back in the day, I might've done like a filter for like the whole Pioneer Square unit. Say, hey, come listen to me, Josh, talk, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't I, done that for a long time. It, I miss that because if Instagram, I don't know. I don't know if Instagram does that by geolocation because when you do filters, you're not really looking at geolocation for that. Yeah. I think that's what Snapchat's strong suit always is. Yeah, that geo filter, that was, that's you walk great, around, you great. swipe and you're like, Oh, what's the city? And, what's and, the city's logo? Yeah. What's it going to look like? And what's then the you event? can, then you can see whoever like clicked on it and you see who it was and you got to reach out to him later on. I think, you know, yeah. And that, and that was fun. And uh, I missed that. And we should probably experiment with that sometime to see if it's truly dead or not. My money is on is dead, but you know, I could yeah. be wrong. Yeah. Good. 
oh, hey, it could be extremely cheap. They're like, please pay us anything. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, or it could be like, a, you got to go through 10, 20, 30 steps to get to the function now because they hit it somewhere. That too. I don't know. We could go Pioneer Square, drop 50 bucks and dominate for the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I don't know how many homeless people are using Snapchat, but uh, be surprised. Fair enough. <laughs> be surprised. Never know. So next, uh, Twitch. So Twitch is mean like a gaming channel where people don't know, like, actually, this is on live on Twitch. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of great podcasts on Twitch. Like there's a one I follow called This Week in Tech. I can't think of his name, but he does like a daily tech feature, all things tech on there. There's a lot of great podcasts on Twitch here. But of course, more people think of it as a game, right? Mm-hmm. So Twitch is great because this ties into like part of my new job at NBC and Comcast because I'm running their uh, gaming channel analytics and their their digital gaming network. So like I, I get officially announced the job eventually. I visit them next week, but I'm officially the director of insights and analytics at Comcast Spectacore. Game. Congratulations. Like, yeah, I sold out guys. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Twitch is interesting because the first thing people think of is gaming, but the platform itself has so many sub niches that it's, it's not just gaming. There's lifestyle, there's crafts, there's vlogs, there's some weird people that just sit and eat things. There's, 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 there's people who do 24 7 their whole life. And there, I'm like, there's, there's definitely crap on there. One time there's a channel called Just Chatting. You know how you do a rap with Just Chatting? And I found this channel is this young lady in a bikini in a jacuzzi eating sushi. That's all she did for hours on time, right? And she had so many followers, so many people give money. Of course, she's just fractured, you know. It's not so. a bad job. It's not a bad yeah. job. Is though so yeah, it's it's but it's a lot of stuff on there, I think. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of ways you can you can spin it. There's a lot of people that like, do the music based channels, they'll have like late night piano stuff. Some people have that piano stream on while they fall asleep and people will request songs and they'll literally play people to sleep. And I'm like, wow, the chat's not super active, but you have people watching as background music while also you're supporting a viewer. So there's different KPIs when it comes to Twitch and Twitch has like subscriptions and how you yeah, support yeah. people. So there, there's a lot you can do. You could buy points to support the channel. You can follow the channel for two dollars. Twitch gets one dollar. This creator gets one. You can uh, become invested in their community, become a super fan, unlock the emotes because it's basically the best way to tweet uh, to treat Twitch is to create a uh, schedule because people are tuning in mm-hmm. and it's supposed to be your show and it's going to be part of your pattern because YouTube is different where you know. You, you know they upload every saturday you don't need to be there when it uploads mm. you go i'll be home sunday i'll just i'll watch it then but since twitch is live it creates that interaction of going oh well i want to watch my favorite streamer i want to engage with them and it's really fostering a community and that's the most important thing you can't be an asshole you gotta be your personality and find your niche and as long as you're not doing any harm good job build your niche build your community and uh the best way to approach Twitch is not approach it through di- uh, donations. You want to approach it through engagement. Uh, unique viewers is hard to get, but me and my best friends stream every now and then, and we'll get random random viewers, and they stick around a long time. But that's because me and him are we're not treating it like a show. Like you will tune into us, and we're gaming, and it's just two friends riffing on each other and roasting each other half the time, venting about their week. So it's more of a podcast in a way, but we react to the in game. And that creates just the right amount of engagement because people don't want anything super production on, mm-hmm. on Twitch. Twitch is still the people's platform. Mm-hmm. They're, everyone's done with giant scripted company backgrounds. All that, not that, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying corp, giant corporate yeah. stuff trying to be friendly. Coca-Cola is a charity Twitch and they're like, this is obviously fake. What are you covering up? But um, people like people to be real. They're working on themselves they're working on their business whether they be gaming crafting i know a lot of like uh people who are really good on etsy you know just stream them building or working mm-hmm. on their craft and people treat that either as asmr or background noise and they just find it fascinating so it's twitches has unlimited potential it's really just finding the right way to foster an audience because it's about engagement and i don't suggest people stream on twitch constantly because I think it's some, there's something wrong if you're growing up on wanting to be a Twitch game streamer and you're always on. You like you feel like you always have to perform. Mm-hmm. And then I see that carry over with other t- Twitch friends where if they hang out in a social situation, they're a little more animated. I'm like, you're not a camera, man. You, gotta, you can relax. I think Vex's example, you, you might have heard about this too. Like, I can't remember what it was, but Snoop Dogg was doing a, doing a Twitch. Like he was playing his game live, right? Oh, I love him. Yeah. And then 
I guess he forgot to turn the switch, the, the thing off right. So it was live like 12 hours. He woke up like, oh, shit, this fucking thing's so fucking on. Yeah. My other favorite story of his is he, I think he was streaming for like a week. He's muted the whole time. No, <laughs> he didn't even know. And I was like, everyone's trying to tell him, but he doesn't know where the chat window is and stuff. And then one day he's like, oh, I'm muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm like, it's been a week. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, he's probably hired something, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. So next, your your specialty supposed to be YouTube. Can you talk about YouTube, and then like, and can you kind of compare to YouTube to Twitch? Like, somebody go on YouTube, somebody go on Twitch. Is I'm sure it's based on industry and stuff like that like that, right? Yeah, yeah. There there is some crossover. Um, Twitch is the unscripted, the bulk content. You're there for the long run. You're there for the interaction. Uh, YouTube, you have less of an attention span. They want it to be curated. They want you to take the highlight moments. Uh, or to break down the topics because like I work with like treatment centers and we'll upload the webinar sessions that are public. And sometimes the two hour webinar won't do that well, but we'll pick out five or 10 moments of really good questions and break that up to different videos. And then those do much well uh, better because if you're on YouTube and you see a three hour video, unless you know it's a podcast that you don't have to stare at, then you're going to listen to it. But um, or rather, you're not going to listen to it because it's too long. Uh, for YouTube content, it's really finding your niche and posting more videos doesn't always mean more attention or more money because the way the algorithm works is uh, if your video basically gets attention, shows up at the home feed, people are clicking on it, great, your next one, the momentum's going to carry over. If a video does really bad for some reason, and let's say you're the user, and you're going through your home feed and you see, oh, uh, this guy posted today. I don't want to really want to watch that right now. And you scroll past it. The algorithm goes, that guy hates you. Mm -hmm. I'm never showing your video to him again for a week. And uh, so it suppresses that next video from that subscriber because it says, oh, they weren't obvious, uh, interested because I put it on their home feed. and They just scrolled past it. Oh, no. So there, it's kind of shit. <laughs> but um, YouTube's finally doing different tools that help people get discovered. Story tools are one of them. Any video under 60 seconds is automatically converted to a short. And shorts are shareable, digestible, and most importantly, they are only vertical video, ideally. And uh, that means it's one of the first functions that you can take from YouTube and then upload it to all the other platforms that do the vertical video. I did not know that you do that. Because usually now, you got because uh, before that, you know, if you did TikTok, you can't just take that they take that TikTok video, then upload it to YouTube. You'd have to re-render the format so it fits the YouTube player, or else it's gonna be like either zoomed in or blocky or just look really bad. But now everyone's kind of on the same page. We know vertical vertical video is here. So just from a content strategy wise, it helps in the old overall like waterfall strategy. And I find that really fascinating. And then story story or shorts are important for discovery. It's easy to share. It's simple. And it's a perfect way to start pitching content. So you could be like, hey, today I answered this question. Here's the clip. And you go through and you go, if you want to see the full episode, link below. Super simple, super direct. And people go, oh, I really want to learn more of that topic. And then there's the stories function, which is still in beta. And you have to be invited. There used to be a request link for YouTube, but they don't do that anymore. Um, but it's, it's just like Instagram stories. But I think the limit is a minute long per upload and it stays up up to 72 hours or maybe up to five days and you could change the setting. Mm. But the most important thing about that is it's not shown to your subscribers. It's meant to show to people who are related in your category. And that's really interesting to me because that's one of the first discovery tools we had on YouTube in a long time. Because other than that, you have to rely on getting your tags right and optimizing your video, which is title sentences utilize the hashtags that they added and then uh doing all the check marks that they do like did you put cards did you put an end screen did you make is do you have an hd thumbnail is there a custom thumbnail things like that and then all the tags being the tag structure should be your your main categories so your brand uh what genre it is is it a podcast what are you talking about like all those and then episode specific ones guest name um things you guys talked about in the video specifically if there was name drops 
and then also take those terms, literally just put it in the YouTube function, see what the top videos are and see how you can relate to that. Cause you can't just copy another video's tags and put it on your channel. <laughs> like now I'm going to get a million views. Cause I copied all of PewDiePie's yeah, I, tags. I, yeah. I copied Joe, I, I copied Joe Rogan. I copied all Mr. Beast's tags, you know, doesn't work because you don't have, because the algorithm will be like, Oh, they have the same tags. Yeah, but this one's not getting as much views as that one, so I'm not going to pay attention to this one. I can't make money off this because mm -hmm. YouTube needs, needs to make money. Oh, yeah, definitely. In some way. And then um, once you utilize those proper category tags with people related to you, that's how you get the chance to show up in the recommended section. And that's where the discovery tool is. The main, that's the main discovery tool. Uh, but stories is a nice addition to just start getting new subscribers. But you just got to craft the content like a hook. and uh, that's great. That's great because TikTok is around so much now. You understand the right format, so you can apply that to shorts, to stories, where it's all short form content. Where's the hook? Where's the value? Oh, I want to see more. Where do I go? So, what's your opinion on, on things like TubeBuddy and those kind of like things that supposed to like help you out increase the YouTube they, stuff? They, they work because technically you can do all that without them. If you go on any video and right click on the page and inspect element, then control F or just search for keywords. You'll find all the metadata there. It's just tedious. VidIQ and TubeBuddy, I use VidIQ. Uh, it's just great for at a glance because it has all the keywords already listed, what they're ranking for and the keyword value for each video. And that's important. And when you're in the back end, it says boost video. That doesn't mean it's going to push views into your video. All it means, it unlocks the section that you paid for saying, based on these tags, these are the videos that you're gonna most likely show up for the recommended section. How can you leverage that? And you might look at your tags and look at those videos and go, I'm not related to those at all. Then you gotta start deleting tags, see when it starts to get more in line with, then visit those videos, look what extra tags they have and go, okay, that's the sphere I'm trying to get into. So next, Josh, talk about your opinion on like, you know, there's a big thing recently, like, you know, freedom of speech, censorship on like social media platforms. Like some people will say, well, they're like a private company, they do what they want to. The people who are no actually like they're public companies because they're IPO. So what you taking the censorship, freedom of speech, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think it's complicated fast. Um, as long, first off, do no harm. That's the number one thing. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and especially with tight lines versus pandemics and polarization on politics and stuff. Uh, I just think there should be an option to mute those type of things instead of forcing it on because a lot of Facebook right now is nothing but arguments or misinformation. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't browse Facebook anymore. Most the main thing I use on Facebook is the, the business pages or I just use Messenger. Yeah, to talk well, to Facebook, you know, on Monday, someone's an expert on, you know, COVID. Then Tuesday, they're expert on Ukraine. Wednesday, they're expert on yeah. something else, right? Like, I knew this article from Facebook. I'm like, you can't quote Facebook as your source. No one's going to trust you. Uh, I get I get not so happy when they start censoring things on a larger scale as a private company for their own interests. And if, if you want to get to a very specific example, Trump's banned on Twitter, ISIS isn't, Putin isn't. Yeah. Where's these sanctions? And it's because the leaders of those companies just had a, just went, nah, I don't like them. Yeah. I yeah. can flick the switch and we're going to be praised for it. I'm like, yeah, you're a private company. You can do whatever you want. That's not going to stop. The more you censor though, the more they're going to create these sub companies that are other echo chambers. Yeah, like this, this, this thing, I think, thing called Getter out there and yeah, like the Parler. Truth, Truth Network coming yeah. out. And that's going to be interesting just to see. Like, I'm fascinated by that. Trump raised like billions in a day. I was like, whoa. And there's wait list, and he, he's managed that fantastically. Making a wait list for a social platform where they could sign up all for day one. No, people are invested, they're waiting, they're dedicated. But the problem is when you start limiting the censorship of these free speech places, uh, it's just going to create more branches where people are going to go and get into their own echo, ch echo chambers mm -hmm. and just radicalize themselves. And yes. you, but that that's the history of the world. That's always what happens. We're just seeing it on a digital and yeah, I'm like real time you, scale. Like where you disagree or agree with Trump, like how are you going to like censor him? And like it's, ISIS is stolen there and all this craziness out there. You're like, it is, that's the thing they, I just don't understand. Because it's not our politics and the shareholders don't care. Yeah, presidents have a grudge, so it's it's weird. And then like YouTube censorship, 
that makes sense. They have to put a misinformation clause mm-hmm. if it's relating to news because if it's a sensitive news topic, it might get uh, there might be sponsors who go, we don't want to put our money on that. And they're like, oh shit, we're losing money for like mm-hmm. a trending video. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not putting Coca Cola ads on Ukraine bombing videos. Yeah. Like uh, that's how the whole ad apocalypse started on YouTube when people were just going. So I'm watching this high school fight with World Star where some kid gets stabbed. There's a Coca-Cola ad before that. Does Coca-Cola sponsor this? What's going on? And it's like, and then they're like, oh yeah, this is a we should have updated this system a long time ago. <laughs> so now there's a more curated list on how the ads get onto YouTube. So basically, when you upload a video, uh, when it says processing, it's also doing an internal transcript of your video. It's measuring how many times you swear and what subjects are in it. And it gives you a rating. And that rating will put you in one of three categories. Uh, all ads, some ads, no ads. And all ads is obviously the most profitable one because that's anything. Mid, uh, some ads are like alcohol, tobacco, and smaller business ads sometimes. The no ads is just no ads. And uh, that's how you get graded. And that also affects your uh, level of visibility. If you are starting the podcast with, the F word constantly, <laughs> YouTube's going to go, uh, probably not that one, mm-hmm. but uh, you're allowed to swear on YouTube. And the general rule is you could say about two or three. Yeah. F-words, that's be natural, you know, but and... just not in the first 60 seconds. Okay. And uh, you could bleep it in the beginning. If they bleeped it, they went, we know you're censoring something that's bad. And then everyone's like, no, you dumb idiot. We're censoring it. Cause you told us to, mm. and it makes it funnier sometimes. Yeah. So a lot of YouTubers now will just censor things and it just solves all their problems. But the first 60 seconds on YouTube is important. That's where you should clearly state the topic, your hook, what's involved, and you're already doing that. So that helps because the transcript will look at you and go, gotcha, gotcha. Because YouTube mobile is uh, rolling out a uh, is public transcripts now oh, for wow. videos. I don't know if you've got it on your app, but the other night I was watching like, some clips about norm mcdonald because i love him to death well he died i love him in death uh and, and uh there was a button under the description that says view transcript I'm like this is new and i click it and it has line by line mm. what the video is it's not 100 percent accurate and it depends on people's accent and the way they talk and if you say certain slang it's going to hear it as some other word <laughs> so that's that's the really funny thing uh so it's if you mispronounce F's I've seen in transcripts, it does it as a slur. I'm like, <laughs> wow. That's, you guys should fix that on the robots end. Yeah. I think one thing I realized, you know, people like, you know, like Marcus Zuckerberg, Jack Durst, all this criticism, like, you know, there's all this misinformation out there. Right. But it's not easy. Like there's like literally hundreds of millions of videos, content. Like it's not easy to just go in there and figure it out. Right. And Mark was on a, Zuck was on a Lex Friedman podcast talking about all the technical challenges. Are, right. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. Like, you know, get, you know, find the, the misinformation. Right. It's just a challenge, I think. And if people don't realize it, I don't think how hard that is. Yeah, it's not easy. And uh, you and that's why you always have to do your own research. And uh, a lot of people don't. No, they, they don't. don't want to. They go, I don't want to challenge my thoughts. I'd rather just live in my own little echo chamber. Well, my best friend, John, Tom, said this, so it must be right. Yeah, like, I trust him, supports my views. I'm like, okay, well, as long as you're not shoving down people's throats, I don't really have a problem with that. But if you're picking fights on Twitter constantly, I'm like, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. It's a lot of effort to be that angry, especially people who argue on Facebook. I'm like, wow, you got yeah, literally nothing else Like, you have to no do. time. Like there's that one meme that talks about how cyberbullying real. Just close your eyes. Just I know, right? The phone. I'm yeah. Like, like, yeah, that's fair. Because like I, I ran, I experienced a, my first real intense cyberbullying once, um, where we worked on a Kickstarter campaign for a video game project, and we were really happy with this. We were super proud, and it was doing okay. And then uh, we, uh, a friend, put it on Reddit because he's like, "Oh, that's gonna help," and they just tore it apart. And then I read the comments, and I felt really shitty, and I went. Oh, I don't give a fuck about Reddit. No, never yeah. mind. And I just yeah. never revisit the topic. I'm like, it's not for them. Yeah. That's all. You got, you got to have a thick skin. So, Josh, from your point of view, what makes a YouTube channel successful? Authenticity. Authenticity. That's it. Uh, there's, all, there's so many hats you have to wear, video editor and doing format. You need to have authenticity because if you're just a genuine person and you're trying to help share your passion or explain something or teach, 
then you have the potential already to go far. After that, you need to take it as a, a critical eye on how you're going to refine your craft. You might be making 10 minute videos about your favorite video game or some, or your favorite hobby. And then going, watching it back after a few weeks going, oh man, I kind of just pause a lot and I ramble. Oh, I should just edit that part out. And then it goes from 10 minutes to like eight minutes. And then you'll, you'll watch it again going, okay, I don't really like this part. No one's going to get this part because that's an inside joke with myself. I should probably remove that. And you just kind of parse it down. And the more concise you get, while still keeping a comfortable flow, mm -hmm. that's going to draw a lot of people. And a lot of people think I need to, you need to have graphics and intro effects and all this stuff. No, you just need to know how to cut down your content. You go on a tangent that's not really relatable to the video. If you take too long to explain something while you're recording, there's no reason why you can't sit down, take a breath, go, I'll just cut that out, explain it again, or redo that scene. So, and then after that, I think a lot of people think on YouTube, especially when starting out, they're seeing their favorite channels post every day. And they're like, I got to do that. I have to do that. But honestly, if you're posting one video every two weeks, you're already in the top 10% of YouTubers. Because mm -hmm. the amount of people who sign up and then go, I'm going to make all these videos a day, even if they're gaming videos. I understand. Like, it's easy to be a Let's Player. You'll play with your friend and then uh, record for like three hours, chop that up into 30 minute things. You're like, look, I got so many videos. Then you go, I got to edit those. <laughs> It builds up, it builds up. And there's another stack of effort when you could just make one really good video and chop that all down. And especially if you're putting eight videos out and then you're not seeing that return, you're going to get discouraged. So it's just all refining the craft and understanding that it might be a hobby, but it's a hobby you have to analyze because it's going to take a lot of your time. You should never approach it to like, oh, I'm going to get rich. I'm going to be the next big YouTuber. I'm like, no, just one video every two weeks. If you want to be aggressive, one a week. If you have the time, great. And I'm talking, these are like crafted videos, mm -hmm. not just like us talking and mm -hmm. doing podcasts because podcasts are a different category, which I'll talk, touch on after. But because uh, through that, it's the learning process. You're going to learn how you speak, how you hold yourself on camera. What topics do you actually want to talk about? What topics are the audience talking about? Uh, how are you editing? What type of th it, it's, it's a process. And usually... Within six months, if you're doing that once a week or once every two weeks, you're going to have a very clear idea of what your channel is going to be. And most of the time, it's not exact. It's not even close to what you started with. And if you're looking to make money on that, you're not going to make money for the first year or year on YouTube. That's just an average. But you got to keep going. You just have to keep going because the amount of people who sign up and then start just hammering up videos. And then after three, three months, they're like, I can't do this anymore. I thought it'd be famous by now. It's too much effort. They burn out. It's the same with podcasts. I know at least 50 people who I help start podcasts or no podcast, maybe two of them are still doing it right. Yep. And with podcasts, uh, YouTube has actually gotten really good for podcasts because as long as you label it as a podcast in like the title or on the thumbnail says podcast, people know, oh, I don't have to watch this. I can just have it on. And then utilizing the back links like with like Podfly and all those online online podcast platforms, you just kind of have to out survive the competition in a way. Because let's face it, a lot of the most famous podcasts, they go on for like three years without anyone noticing them. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is uh, Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast. I mean, I've heard about, I need to start, I, need to I heard a lot of people say great things oh, about that. Oh, he's great. He's got great clips and he's funny just because, well, he brings on his wife a lot too mm -hmm. and they have the best banter. But it started out as him on the road during comedy shows when he was just touring and living on the floor. He would just literally have like a small little setup, a mic, the recorder, and just he just talks to himself for like an hour, answering email questions or talk about what annoys him. And people go, this is interesting. I like him because he's angry for me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I love. And uh, yeah, he's just a very interesting way. Like his podcast has been around for almost 10 years now. I did not realize that. Only picked up like the last three or four. Yeah. One thing you did, it has to be a labor of love. Like you can't start a podcast, anything like content or wise to say, mm -hmm. oh, it's six months. I'd be Joe Rogan Jr. I mean, it's going to, it's going to be a grind. You got to, you know, yep. you got to have a love for it, so to speak. You yep. know, you got to, you gotta, there's you a lot of experience it. that comes into it. And you're going to realize there's a lot of different assets you, you suck at. <laughs> you got to learn Definitely. those. And you, you go, all right, am I going to learn these trades or not? And uh, if you love to create, great. 
might not always be for you, but there's a bunch of other stuff to do, uh, go out there and create. And then sometimes people just don't want to be on the internet. They want to create, they go, Oh yeah, I'll go paint. So no one's watching me. Yes. Next talk about like uh, programs or companies like SEMrush, HR refs, you know, uh, I think Neil Patel and Uber suggest all these marketing things out there people need to use. So I'm split on that because I don't use any of those really. Cause as a Google expert, I use just Google. Mm -hmm. I use the Google keyword planner, the ad researcher. I use SEO quake, which is a free plugin that lets you glance at a site and just like pull your keywords or meta tag. It'll tell you what's wrong with it. And if you know that knowledge, you go, Oh, I know how to fix this immediately. And then I combine Google analytics and Google search console with like those tools you can run an agency off of. You don't need enterprise software. SEM rush is great for like tracking rankings, but rankings are a very tricky thing because Google rankings doesn't guarantee you traffic. Google rankings can actually give you the worst traffic. And the more you obsess about the numbers, the harder it gets because that's not your metric you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on healthy site traffic coming in, growing over time each quarter and understand seasonal dips if they happen. You should have a healthy indexing rate for the website itself. And then the main part are people calling and buying you, buying from you. That's, that's the thing. You can be ranked number one, but like if your metadata is shit, if your website format is shit, people can be clicking on you, but there's, they're not going to be going through the whole sales pipeline you set up. And the problem is now that the Google updates are so customized to you, rankings are very hard to narrow down. If you were searching for this one type of company, like for shoes, and there's a client I, I manage that does this particular brand of shoes, you could be clicking on this other company a lot more mm -hmm. because they might have ads on Facebook or you're more familiar with them. You click them a few times. It's just going to push mine down just because it goes, oh, he's not interested in that. He likes this company and it's relevant to his personal mm. data. So the, the closest you can get to rankings is just searching in incognito mode. It'll still use your geolocation, but it'll turn off all your cookies. So you'll get a better estimate of where you're at or what terms, but you, I implore people do not stress about rankings. It's going to make your life a living hell. I have clients who sometimes keep themselves up at night, Googling their own name for their website. And then one day it disappears and they go, what happened? I'm like, you Googled it so much and you never clicked it. Google went, obviously he doesn't want to see this. Mm -hmm. You would have clicked on it by now or else you would have searched it a hundred times over the past month. And then they freak out. And then I have to explain personal data, Cookies, Big Brother's always watching you. How oh, Google's collecting everything. Amazon's always listening. This is how it's all tailor made. And organic rankings help people trying to find that in their own search history. And that's what I build up. So, AREFs is pretty good for just keyword research. Uh, SEM Rush is great for like, if you're doing like enterprise level stuff, you need to track rankings among like locations or landing pages or cities. Yeah, you can do that. It makes it easier. But most SEO experts should be able to use just the core free tools and then go from there. Anyone can learn SEO. It's not that complicated as people might think. The most complicated thing is probably interpreting the data and the trends from Google Analytics and Search Console. But you can, the average person can get like a C plus or B minus score on mm -hmm. SEO because all you need to do is download the tools. Most websites and web builders have SEO fields. And if you Google like how to do SEO, read the first 10 articles, you'll get a firm understanding on it. You might not understand everything, but you're going to get the gist of it because all SEO is, is a certain word in certain places, a certain amount of times. That's the bottom line. There's a lot of other check marks on that. But if you learn what that checklist is, you can optimize a page. And then if you want to get more in depth, you can get Yoast if you work on a WordPress site and pay for the Yoast Pro. And it literally handholds you. It will tell you everything wrong for the bare minimum requirements for the page. And you can type it in and it makes it a little green light. And you're like, okay, good, I'm working. 
That won't get you to an A plus score, but that will get you to the bare minimum, which is a lot better than most sites have. So Josh, can you talk more about Google Analytics, what that is and how people can take advantage of that free tool? Yeah, so it's a free tool that you install on your site. It tracks users for their location, how long they've been on the site, how many pages they're reading. There's a bunch of different metrics that are useful. Uh, the ones I like to concentrate on is new versus old visitors. Your new use visitor ratio should always be pretty high, above 70%, because you want new people visiting you. The old people will always come back then. That's great. You always have an audience, but you want new people coming in. The amount of your site traffic doesn't matter because I've started with certain sites that they're brand new. We got 100 a month over time. We could do 1,000. Currently, this one has 20K a month. It takes time to grow and as you mature in the Google indexing cycle. <clears throat> so the, what you wanna do is concentrate on bounce rate uh, because if your bounce rate is below 40, 45%, that's good. That, that's pretty standard. If it gets lower than that, fantastic. Yeah, bounce rate is when somebody goes to your site and they leave with like the 30 seconds, right? Yeah. So they either thought it was wrong or they don't like it. And if you have good SEO, that usually means, no, the right people are finding you. Now it's up to site design. You need to look at it through some common sense eyes going, okay, is the site too busy? Is my call to action color is actually working? Is there too many call to actions? Because one of my <laughs> things that happen the most as an SEO guy, designers usually hate me. They will design this beautiful site all the colors will be color coordinated. And I come in and go, change that button to green. Like, it doesn't fit. I'm like, that's why. Change it to green. It's the mm -hmm. first thing I notice. But you're not going to notice the logos. I don't care about the logos. Mm -hmm. I care about people clicking that button. Mm -hmm. And uh, so bounce rate, you got to figure out how the site works. What's the pipeline of the site? How are you going to get somewhere to your destination within two clicks? If you go to three, you're going to lose a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So it should be a selling point for whatever page they land on. Yeah, I need that bring up contact form or schedule a call. Then site speed plays a lot of part of that too, right? The yes, site speed. site speed. And then also mobile. A lot of people, when they update their website, they forget about mobile, where I tell someone, hey, for SEO, you need X amount of words on the homepage. And they go, got it. And there's a paragraph that's like 500 words. And I'm like, we have to change this. Bring it up on the phone. I'm scrolling for three or four mm -hmm. scrolls, just trying to get through it. That's, you're not a journalist site. People mm -hmm. are going to gonna leave. So that's important because that helps give context on how people are reacting to mm -hmm. your site. The next one is uh, pages per session. That means how many pages on average is the user reading? So if they're reading like above 1.5, that's good. So there's always gonna be a drop off of your audience. Some people are gonna get to the homepage and then go, oh yeah, this interests me and they'll read it. So you always want to get that up. The higher you can get that, the better, because that's going to help with your sales pipeline or just getting that lead generation. Uh, and the next one would be average session duration. If your website has bare bones content, it's not going to be that high. But if there's some decent reading to do, just like 800 words on the homepage and your service pages have a nice breakdown, mm -hmm. about 600 words, you should be looking at above 45 seconds. And the longer someone is on your site, the more invested they're going to be and the more invested they're going to, uh, or the more likely they're able to click and get that lead. There's a lot of different ways to increase watch, uh, not watch time, watch time, the YouTube version, uh, session, uh, duration is um, embedding videos onto the page. Because if, when given the chance to read an article or just watch a video on it, people are usually going to watch the video as long as the video is not really long. You can summarize basically what's on the page in like under three minutes. Most people are gonna be like, oh yeah, sure. And then that counts as them on the page being invested and they're interacting with your content. That value proposition has been established. So they have a like, like more likely chance to generate that lead. Um, those are the main points when you get onto the analytics dashboard. The second one is seeing where your traffic comes from. So they'll all, there'll be one thing that says keywords and you'll click on it, it says no data. That's where you go to search console for. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there's the other traffic sources. It'll tell you all your backlinks. What's coming in from Facebook? What's coming in from 
other social media sources? Is the referral links coming to you? And if so, where? Are they good links? Are they bad links? Are they bots from India? What's going on there? And then there's direct traffic, people who are regularly returning to you because they either bookmarked you, have you in another tab, or the URL autofills and they're revisiting the site. And then at the end of every quarter, if you are really looking at your site strategy, if not every six months is fine, if not every year, there is a behavioral tree that you can look at. It'll tell you all the top pages that have been visited throughout the time frame. I like to just look at it at the year for a year review. And then you take to see what's the main category or homepage. They immediately go to this service page. You'll see 60% of people went here. Okay, I need to put my efforts on that page to give, to give context on the site and build up that service so I can capture more people. That's what they're interested in. Or there might be a page that you're really wanting to grow, but you're looking on the tree that they go to it, but there's like an 80% drop-off rate. And then you go, clearly they're clicking it, but they're not enjoying what they see. Something's not connecting. Is the page design messy? Does the messaging need to be reworded? Does the header need a more attention grabbing or clear title? And uh, yeah, it's all about user behavioral data. That's what Google Analytics is. It's going to be giving context to see how your website is actually performing. So Josh, are there any like social media, SEO, marketing people that you follow? Uh, you, that's about it. <laughs> social media gives me a headache. <laughs> I, I live and breathe it, so I don't want to see yeah. it when I'm trying to relax. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. So next, we're going to go back to like your nerdy, geeky side, right? Uh, so your, your, your uh, I can't think of the term, but your, your social media handles, yeah, social media handles are pretty, it's like Mr. Sky, Mr. Sci-Fi Guy. Mr. Sci-Fi Guy. Yeah. Where did that come from? I, I was a fan of the Sci-Fi Channel growing up, <laughs> and I was trying to sign on to like one of my first usernames, and they're like, Sci-Fi Guy's taken. I'm like, Mr. <laughs> sci-Fi Guy. And uh, stuck ever since. I, I'm like, huh, I already got a name. I don't need to change it. So next, you know, you also do a lot of work for, for national brands. Talk about, do you have to change your, your, like your strategy for national brands versus like small business? Do you have to like care the way, change the way you do things? It depends. A small business, uh, they're a lot more gung-ho. Like as long as you can explain it to them, they're usually willing to listen and they're invested because that, that's their company directly, you know? If I'm helping someone grow the restaurant, they're like, yeah, this needs to work or else uh, it's going to go out of business. Like, yeah, no pressure. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks. Um, when it comes to the more national brands, there's a ch either a chain of command or a marketing team. I have to either educate or clarify. And then once you're doing well, you have to learn how to report your efforts in a very clear way to either the president or the uh, whoever you're reporting to so they can relay that in a clear way to satisfy whoever at whatever level you're in and um it, it's on and off some national brands are a joy to work with other ones are you'll never talk to the same person twice and so how do you get these national brand accounts that you're working with how do you how do you get them as customers oh for me it's just referrals i uh, I attribute some of it to uh, working in Hollywood. I got a job at Live Nation and I stuck with Live Nation because I'm like, this isn't a springboard. I can use this name. And once you have that, you can start get your foot in the door for everything else. But it's really just networking. You never know who you're going to meet. That's so true. You never know where they're going to end up. I used to shoot a bunch of restaurant videos just for like small businesses and local chains. And a few years later, after the, a few years ago, yeah, I think we're coming up a two-year anniversary. Uh, he became like a director of marketing at like uh, 85 Degree Bakery. He calls me up. He's like, hey, you want to manage these campaigns? I'm like, yeah, I know that store. Let's do it. Do I get free bread? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's just, it's just networking and keeping up good co connections as any good business person or entrepreneur should. You never know where people are going to lead. Uh, People, where people are going to end up and if you're consistently providing value and just showing that you keep doing what you do like i get a lot of referrals from these companies just because at any given time they could leave me for a year and come back like josh is still posting about this on social media clearly he's still doing this he's the guy we think of well, i got a lot of people when they think of youtube they think of their youtubers and then me mm -hmm. people think of me on uh, as youtube on instagram I'm like well thank you and everyone always goes, why don't you have a channel? Like, 
because I know exactly how much work goes into it. <laughs> and I do not have the team or money for that. And then I will turn, then I'll turn my hobby into my job. And I don't want that part. Let's talk about this. You no know, SEO takes mm-hmm. some time, right? Anymore for six months a year. Of course, someone's not for SEO, the SEO person you just take for six months, eight months a year. And the person will trust them. But then after six months, there's no change, nothing's happened or whatever. How, what's your advice as a small business owner or anyone to say to pick the right SEO person, right? Because all SEOs are not the same. You know, some people just start on day one, no knowledge like you. Like, how do they know? What, what does the person, what person do they need to ask the SEO person to prove that they're going to get the results they're paying for? So <clears throat> as a rule, I just don't like agencies. I've worked at agencies and they're all, they're just money oriented. They'll put your your uh, site into a piece of software and it'll spit out a data report that is just images and rank numbers. And they go, there you go. And it costs a lot of money. And the reason they try to sign you on for six months to a year, because it's just guaranteed income. I like to go for SEO experts, which I consider myself, I'm not an agency. I'm an expert. I live and breathe the algorithm. I walk into it. And I understand what needs to be fixed and I become invested in your company. I'm part of that. If you don't have a marketing team, I'm assuming that role at that point. Um, so you need to under, you need to set benchmarks and you want to look at the right amount of traffic. If they're going to offer a um, website, if they're going to work on your website or if they're going to offer website notes. So if the bounce rate's off and you want to ask them, oh, hey, what can we do if the bounce rate's off? And if they just say, change the content, ask to be more specific. Um, you should never do a six month contract right off the bat. When I work with clients, whether it be national or local, I do a three month structure because the first month is always key. It's just keyword research, essentially. It takes about two weeks to research all the keywords and go back and forth with the client. I'll take, I'll be like, hey, give me like five sites that are either competitors or related to you and give me like 20 keywords that you think someone would search for you or your business. Not your name, just like what people would look for. They give me that. I go through those other sites. I rip their tags, put them in a document. I just I go through. Then I Google those sites. I Google related sites. I see the auto of fill on Google. I see all the recommended searches. Take all that. So I usually have a keyword list of about 300 words by that point. I go to Keyword Planner, paste that in, get keyword ideas, sort it. Now I have a keyword list of about 2,000. Sort it and then have a nice drink, stare at it, and then uh, parse it down. I get it down to about a hundred, send it back to the client and go, of these hundred, which ones are on the money, and which ones you hate? And they'll highlight on the Excel table, send it back. Then I narrow it down to about 20, maybe 15. And I go, these are the core ones. These are the ones that aren't just high value. There's like, there's, there's low hanging fruit in there. I got different levels of competition. Because I, you can't include the word, like, if you're a shoe store, I'm not going to put the word shoe. They're like, that's a keyword. Yeah, no shit. But it's also got 3 billion searches a month and its competition is high. Shoe store, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Shoe store location, that makes sense. You know, it's how to actually parse it down. The reports shouldn't contain any fluff. Um, the If you receive a report and it's just screenshots of rankings, mm-hmm ask to see the analytics and see if they can interpret your search console experience. Because that's the, that's the big thing about SEO. I can fix your website's metadata all I want, get the right keywords. But if your website's not hitting the technical benchmarks that Google wants, it's not gonna do shit. And that's why search console is important because it measures your site health, how it's performing on, video, on phones, on video, on external links, on desktop, tablets, and how often it's being indexed on your site. And if there's any problems with the sitemap, a page not loading, is there an error coming in for a URL? And that's important to see. Also, it's got a really nice popular pages tab that shows you directly your impressions versus your clicks. Because impressions are important because that's your reach. Your clicks is, well, your clicks. That's how you determine your click-through rate to see how many people you're converting. And then from there, you would also ask them, if you would, what they would do to in, incorporate the queries tab from Search Console to their existing strategy they have planned for you. Because when you come to SEO, it's very hard to be like, hey, so what, did, what am I going to get in three months? I'm like, ideally, you could be optimized because I can show you that your site is at zero and uh, we're going to increase site traffic. That's step one. Like, am I going to rank more? I'm like, 
again, got to go back to the ranking issue. Mm -hmm. Just because it's going to show up for you doesn't mean it's going to show up for them. It's all personalized ranking data at this point with the algorithm. So those are some of the questions I would uh, look out for. Make sure they have a good understanding of Google Analytics and if they're going to incorporate like your social links, referral links, and just see how it's going to go, or are they just going to do the keywords? Um, are they going to provide any feedback for the bounce rate uh, on site design and site notes? And then how they're going to take a look at Google Analytics and address any like 404 errors, any redirect issues, and the queries that are going to come in from Search Console. So Josh, uh, let's talk about this. So recently you got a shout out. I don't know if I'm saying this wrong. There's a YouTube channel, I think, or maybe something else called The Fascinating World of Kedek Harris. This guy gave you a great shout out, right? Oh, Can yeah. you talk about what you do for, for, for them? Kedicarous, yeah. Kedicarous. Uh, <clears throat> so I specialize in growing channels, especially from international audiences, because I know how to, I hate the term, but it is true, growth hack. <laughs> uh, certain sub, sub notifications, because when you're established in one country, doing really good, uh, if you move, uh, your video lo upload location to a different country and you're already getting like base amount 100k mm -hmm. views per video you're gonna have a really strong chance to grow a new audience there thing is there's a lot of tricky ways you you just can't throw on a vpn and upload from that country mm -hmm. youtube will just straight up ban you there is a there is some tips and tricks you got to do to get around it legally and uh i was so surprised when he gave me that shout out i was just i was i was very happy uh because he's one of my favorite youtubers and friends online he was uh killing himself making like eight videos a month and i came in and they were like can you help him I'm like yeah let's see and over the course of a year we started to pull back on the videos we and we developed a format that works better for him and now his he does one video a month and it's like an hour long what, 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 what does he actually do what's this what's he actually company what's he do uh some of it's gaming, but all, it's also entertainment. So he kind of does like compilation topic videos. So if there is a movie franchise out, he'll play like all the shitty games that mm -hmm. came out from it and like some merchandise that came out. And then it'll the video might be 50 minutes long, but they're like five minute segments on each single one. And we got to stack watch time through that by changing the topic and building out like a list type of video essentially to keep people engaged. and. He went from eight videos a month to and scrambling to now he posts one video a month and each one averages 1.5 million views. And we just keep going and I do his tags, I help with his descriptions and I do uploads and I'm the channel manager and uh, I'm just happy to help. How many clients can you like actually handle each month? Like what's your breaking point, so to speak? It depends. Uh, for SEO on my own, I can handle that like seven and then i start bringing outside help uh because the keyword research just takes too long i i'm really good at the keyword research but at a certain point when i have to implement everything that, that's that's the easy part of the job that's the most time consuming you know i'll have the roadmap out i'm like okay i know where the keyword goes on what page and how many times and that's gonna be a few hours of work it's easy work but i have more i have better things to start doing at that point uh, YouTube, it just depends on the upload schedule. I had to cut back on a few things because now that I'm running all the marketing for G4 TV, which is the main brand of my new job, it's it's a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> it's a lot of Twitch streams to upload, uh, uh, to manage, and a lot of insights I have to figure out and clean up and build out a proper data pipeline. But uh, for YouTube, I guess it's, I don't really, I'm not really channel manager for anyone else right now because I'm too busy, but I do take consultation calls. I do free ones and then some people love it. And they're like, what do I, what do I pay you? I'm like, dude, here's my Venmo, here's my PayPal, whatever you feel is fair. Like I'm, I'm not really in it for the money right now because I don't need it. And I also know how much YouTubers make and it's hard. <laughs> So, and and it's it, it also sucks because YouTube doesn't help people. They you you can't go to a YouTube support forum. They're like, how do I actually make my tags work? They're like, oh, you just put it related to your video. There's so many YouTube secrets out there that is just tips and tricks that you have to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. And it gets complicated because 
I'm one type of YouTube strategist. There will be other YouTube strategists or YouTubers that have been around for 10 years. They got a completely different way of doing things. We can achieve the same results, but we differ on different issues. Some people hate scheduled videos. Some people think that it suppresses them. Some people say it only suppresses you after over 24 hours. Some people say it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters, but I got mm. I have some people who refuse to do it. Mm. And I'm like, all right, I'll respect that. I don't have to understand it to respect it, but you do you, man. So let's talk about science fiction real fast. Mm -hmm. What's something that you think is going to come like true in the future, like something crazy science fiction? Thing? For example, I started watching a show called Your Million on a Nat, Nat Geo. Mm -hmm. And they say like in the future, you're going to be able to inject like these microbiotic micro robots into your cells. Mm -hmm. It's going to cure all diseases, right? And I also think that, you know, in your like your million, you know, you're, you're like someone close to might die and you replace them with an Android. Like, so what kind of crazy off the wall thing Skyfire thing you think is going to come true? See, all my high fantasy and fiction that I like is grounded. Is it called? It's called hard science fiction, where like in Halo, they got some pretty crazy ideas, but they have like in universe technology that you can refer to in real time. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, yeah, th this works because we're traveling faster than light, but it's this addition that mm -hmm. makes it like teleportation mm -hmm. or something like that. So it's grounded in a way. Um, I think the most realistic one you can say is going to be gene therapy. I mean, they're already doing that now, right? June, like, I think there's a thing a little while ago with this uh, Chinese doctor, like, did gene therapy without the parents' permission on child. And I suppose the child will never catch HIV, you know, because all the ethics and stuff involved like with that. that. <laughs> all the ethics and stuff involved with that, of course. I'm just excited for more robots. And people are like, oh, yeah, drones are going to be the future of warfare and stuff. I'm like, yeah, but that's kind of boring. I want to be in a mech suit. I want to pilot a Gundam, <laughs> but like, uh, I think the most accurate, if like we're getting like into crazy future stuff was, um, <clears throat> did you see the, cause the, the book is good, but the, uh, the movie has a very distinct way of showing it. Uh, Ender's game. I didn't see that. Okay. Well they make some people complain that the movie is boring. I'm like, no, they stayed very true to the book. It's just it's really hard to maybe connect with emotionless teens sent to war, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the way they fight in space is like the only logical way it's going to happen. Mm. People want it to be like Star Wars and mm. pilots and everything, but no, it's a central ship and they have a million drone ships and you, imp you implement patterns and stuff. Mm. And it's more of a chess match between algorithms. And I'm like, that's, that's going to be like, that's going to be a standard thing. That just makes the most sense. We're already using drones and then people are, not going to be manning people in space no for that it's going to be automated systems fighting automated systems where you have ships in different formations and phalanxes with different attack patterns trying to overwhelm a different algorithm with cyber attack suites happening at the same time <laughs> it's going to be an invisible war and you just sit back from the command uh, be, center be, be, going be, war, oh, war, this works war by software developer pretty much and uh it's less it, like people say it's going to be boring that's kind of boring but i'm like yeah but it's automated. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. Yeah, just like the old Star Trek episode where the back when um, it was really sad was like Captain Kirk, right? They had the thing where they went to a planet and like every month, like a certain number of people for each each planet would go like basically kill themselves, right? Because mm -hmm. the other told them, well, we're not doing anything for real, but you know, each each month you have to you know kill this mountain, this mountain, this, this algorithm, like told them where to die, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, are you going to Mars? Not for a one-way trip, no. <laughs> no. I'm uh, not necessarily you interested in that. You, you don't pass on root, that. I will root for them. I would love to go to space and just look around. Maybe maybe a customer one million to go to Mars. Maybe yeah. Not, by the time not, I'm not, really not old, water. maybe it'll be that little moon base airport, <laughs> like uh, you know, because the Martian made it look all cool. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, but I don't know. I, actually, actually, man, I actually watched the movie yesterday. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't know. It's anything cool about growing potatoes out your own shit though. Yeah, but hey, he claimed bars. So <laughs> yes, he did. He comes back, he's eighty pounds. But I'm like, yeah, it's, this is this is a space castaway, but it's done really well. It's done really well. Very smart. For me, um, one of my favorite space movies is Ad Astra. Have you seen that one? I've, I've heard of it. It's a, uh, I love it. Also because it's grounded. Um, all the people in who are the uh, shuttle pilots and everything are all from Kentucky. It's just like a air airline. They land on the moon and he's in a, it, it's literally just LAX. 
they got kiosks everyone he's commenting he's like yeah they thought we'd have futuristic space stations now we got subway we got starbucks i'm like yeah that's it makes honestly sense, right? what it's gonna be i mean yeah it makes sense yeah you know? and then uh they it's just it's really grounded it's really cool because then like what are they gonna have space coffee in space you exactly. know exactly and then they go to like they go to mars and they're like yeah it's a three-week trip so they're like what do we do like oh yeah they have mood stabilizers they have just little pills they take mm. every day so you don't go insane in isolation mm. realizing that it can, can explode and kill you at any moment because that's that's the biggest thing like you have to be either sedated or in cryo sleep mm -hmm. and cryo sleep would be cool to perfect you know, get some futurama tech in there and, uh, see do, where do you have goes. a favorite like like space thing like star wars star trek space 1999 or uh, it's like a favorite thing you like you like to watch uh, I, I loved Stargate growing up, mm -hmm. but it got a little too niche for me. And I just fell off. Uh, Star Wars is fun. I'm not in invested in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like Star Trek, Picard especially. And I like that they have a new show about him. I'm like, yeah, you're still 80 years old, but now you're running around. Good job, man. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's also because it's a difference because Star, Star Wars is fantasy, mm -hmm. but fantasy dystopia, things are, there's magic and mm -hmm. it, technology works because it does, mm -hmm. just because. But it's also, dystopian because everything's dirty and gritty yeah. but it works and then star trek is utopian based and struggles with moral issues and critical thinking and stuff and it's just a little more engaging to me and Plus then watching cheesy effects is fun and how many things from star trek back to 60s actually true now like the the, the flip phone you know yeah. the hologram all the stuff they like oh man this is actually true now like, just realize it in context of like watching like old school blade runner and they're facetiming and i was like yeah that's amazing technology and now it's something we can do at any time we want i'm like Oh, shit what's gonna happen next holograms please just not metaverse i don't <laughs> want that no one wants that yeah so nick you always talk about the sun but can you go into more detail about your company like how you started doing all this seo stuff marketing how that started what you focus on now what your vision is for the future yeah so i've always been a self-starter in high school i started i'm the reason why they uh stopped selling candy bars and energy drinks on campus because every now and then kids would like have go to Costco and they would like, you know, buy a $15 box that has like Twix and Snickers and anything. They sell it for a buck. I'm like, I could do that, but better. And I, so I started like the clubs would always have fundraisers. And then I would have like a, a bunch of monster energy drinks and like I get candy or and I'd sell like magic, the card game, trading card game packs and stuff. And everyone else would be selling the same thing. But I'm like, no, I got this cheaper. I'm just going to undercut everyone by a dollar. So obviously high school students bought it all for me. I would make my money and keep going. And then they're like, this guy keeps doing this. And the other clubs are complaining How about no one can just sell this stuff anymore. I'm like, that's my legacy. <laughs> Great. Um, and then I only had one real job. I worked at Starbucks for two weeks and I got fed up with it. I was just, I was like, this is not for me. I'm, I'm getting yelled at by someone, some old lady. Cause I don't know how to make a macchiato or whatever, whatever the hell it is. And it was a it was a uh, Starbucks inside a grocery store, so like you're not allowed to leave the pen. You can't mm. even like get out and walk around legally. And I'm like, because it's like a liability issue for anything. So like a lady fell down. She was like screaming for help, and we just had to sit there because we legally could not cross the counter. I'm like, this sucks. I'm done. So like I quit, and I went door to door, just knocking on businesses, asking if they had a website, and I started selling WordPress websites for like 300 bucks a piece. And I did that for like six months and I was in college and I'm like, I got to pay for this, all this stuff. And uh, well, these one-off sites aren't enough. I need to build out my revenue stream. So I got recommended by a, either a friend, a peer, a teacher, someone in the marketing department, like, oh, hey, there's this internship down in Orange County. Uh, you should go check it out. Something called SEO. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I hope it's not a pyramid scheme. It turned out not to be a pyramid scheme. It was just a, a really enthusiastic guy about building passive income, but not in like the shitty way. He was just a very, he just loved the process. I was like, all right, I get this language. So I did the internship for about three months and then uh, my project was very successful. So they brought me on and paid me on the side every now and then. And then they brought me on for the next two years to teach the internship. So that's how I got to also funnel my love of public speaking and visiting colleges and everything into teaching this class twice a year for a, a four six week period and i got paid a little bit for it covered my gas and food too so that was nice and so i started to get that foundation 
And I already had this client list of the people I built websites for. So I just emailed them like, hey, I also can offer this visibility. I don't really know the pricing structure. So can I do like a hundred bucks a month, 150 bucks a month? That sounds good, right? They're like, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> Not knowing I was undercutting myself so low at the time, but hey, it was a learning experience. And then, uh, yeah, just kept growing it, growing it. And then uh, some people would fall off just learning the pitfalls of like the life expectancy of a client. Because usually what I've learned for SEO, especially nowadays, every two years, they'll probably switch marketing teams. I don't know why they should, but someone gets antsy. They're like, we need to try something new. I'm like, but it's working really good. <laughs> and then I got a few clients who mid, mid pandemic were like, we're going to try something new. I'm like, okay. And then like a few months ago, they're like, Hey, uh, you got, you got time. You got, we want you to fix something. I'm like, well, my prices have gone up because you probably took out all the work I already worked on. <laughs> but um, at the time I was in an interesting place in college because uh, this, that was when the schools were becoming banks essentially. So your fast flow of money would run out. And then the school was like, we'll offer you the loan. And then I'm like, that's sketchy. <laughs> and that means they could dictate everything. And they didn't, they weren't prioritizing people leaving. They're prioritizing as much students as they can take and then charge them and keep them in there with interest. And that's when I was like, okay, fundamentally, I see this in the long run. I don't know what to do with this. And then we got the email one day that says, due to overcrowding, the four-year degree is now a six-year degree. And I literally went, fuck this. I was in my class that I was waitlisted for. All, almost all my classes were, were waitlisted. What college are you going to? Cal State Fullerton. It's a shit school. I'm sorry. It just is. Don't go. Uh, <laughs> plenty of other good schools. <laughs> I hope all the people I work with are gone there now. It's a better school though. Um, <laughs> but um, because I, I did a bunch of AP classes in high school. I came in with my first two years basically done. So I was supposed to be out in another two years. And just, you know, that's why I was doing the AP classes to speed through. Then I got caught in the bureaucracy of things where I was supposed to be in my 301 classes at that point. And they wouldn't let me do that because like, oh, no, you're only a sophomore. I'm like, yeah, but I got the credentials. And then someone might've slipped up and they said, well, we have to have a certain number of students graduate on time. And that means they need a certain class size to graduate on time that within four year structure every year to get the grant from the state to show that they're a good school. And uh, I got, I got mad. So I was sitting there on my like third day of college. I only had one class that was accepted. And I was like intro, to, it was like theater for non-acting majors. It was my second time taking it because it just fulfilled a requirement. And my other four classes were 301 classes and waitlisted. And I was just sitting there in the cafeteria and uh, I got a phone call from uh, this producer guy and who was my mentor for a bit on all the, Amazon and TNT and Warner Brothers sets that we worked on because that's how I was also paying my way. I'd be building websites, but going out to film sets and learning lighting, learning rigging, uh, learning how to balance accounting books, become a producer, all that type of stuff. And uh, he called me. He's like, "Hey, uh, you want a job?" I said Live Nation. Can you come in tomorrow? I went. Yep. Dropped out of school that day. So easy decision. Easy decision. I was fed up, and it didn't help that like literally the day of I was talking to uh, my marketing professor and he didn't believe SEO was real. What? He's like, nah, it's not a real thing. That's not real marketing. And in the end, it's because the school can't teach. That's not, they can't teach about it as much because you can't sell a textbook on something that changes every three months. Mm -hmm. And if the college can't monetize it, they're not going to do it. So uh, will I go back to school? I might. You know, I understand it can open more doors than not but i got this really high level position job and they go no we don't care about degree it's all about experience and everything i've built they're, they're more than happy to see and i'm excited to see where i can go with them but uh yeah then i went to live nation i was an intern for the first few months and then they offered me the job formally i was like yay and they made me drive out there from from orange county to santa monica which oh, is brutal I was, and it was during their office hours too. So I would leave at 6 a.m., get there maybe at 8.30. And I did that for like two months. And I'm like, hey guys, you know me? 
can I just show up when I want? I'll still do the hours, but I need to show up at like noon. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Now that you've been here, we trust you. Mm -hmm. So I was, I'd, I'd show around noon, only an hour drive there at that point. So happy. And then I'd leave around like seven or eight and uh, have an hour drive back because I skipped all the traffic. And that's the same rules I apply to Seattle. When I'm driving in downtown, I go, right, if I'm stuck down here, I'm just going to grab dinner and then just leave when the traffic goes. I'm, I'm tired of traffic. Growing up in LA traffic, I'm very zen through it, but uh, I will be annoyed if I have to be in it. <laughs> but um, I built out their department. I started doing all the SEO and I went, hey, your current website sucks. I built websites. Can I build you the new one? I scoped out the project and I knew how to play it because they had a current net web company. And I'm like, I'll get the quote from them too. I pitched what they were going to say. And they're like, yeah, they'll be like 20K to do it. And they're like, whoa, yeah, we can't afford that though they have the money but like they didn't want to do it i'm like fair fair so i go i'll do it for 10. grab my team i had my office at the time we hammered it out in two months and then after that i uh, built out all their landing pages for them and Ticketmaster over the course of three years built out 1200 landing pages for all these talent bookings if you google booking jay leno or booking the beach boys live nation and Ticketmaster pops up and that's me if you attended a concert via Ticketmaster in the past four years, maybe not counting pandemic, you probably saw one of my ads or were influenced by one of my links. And uh, yeah, just built that up and got the springboard from company to company. Use Live Nation as a established and proven track record. They vouched for me. I kick new talent their way. And then uh, how I got started on YouTube is like a different side of the story. Um, you want me to go into that? Yeah. So I was learning all this SEO stuff and I was really good at it, getting all these local businesses to rank. And I was still working on all the film sets. And there was a sketch comedy group called Wise Guys. And they're like, hey, we heard that you're good at marketing and you work on these sets. And I worked with you guys once on this TV show. Come on, let's have a pitch. I'm like, okay, what are they pitching? Are they pitching me something? Am I pitching myself to them? What's going on? And so and they had this plan where they have this they had this uh, show that has been pretty much accepted by Amazon at that point, but it was in the this was like six probably six seven years ago at least where um, Amazon was just starting Amazon videos, and they wouldn't take anyone unless you had like a decent following or prove that the YouTube can get X amount of views, and this is when you could technically inflate the views, but YouTube was really strict about that. So they wanted me to design a YouTube channel so we can build up their main content to get it popular. And then they can use that as leverage saying, yeah, see the pilot episode and our other series got X amount of views. Now you can buy the show because there's audience interest. So just negotiation and leverage. And I went, okay, yeah, I'm down. I like this producer role that I've been working with. I'm going to figure out what works, what doesn't. And I was putting together a content list for them and I sat down and it just clicked in my head. I'm like, wow, Josh, you're an idiot. You know, Google, Google bought YouTube like a year ago. Wonder if the same SEO principles apply. So I started applying all the on-page principles to the video for SEO. We started seeing really good results, but it was also the format because if you were like a sketch comedy show or an entertainment channel, and like the main heart and soul video that you pour your heart into like 10 minute long videos, no one's going to watch that first. They're going to watch your short videos first, or at least back in the day. So we developed the show that was like 30 to 40 seconds long, which now looking back, I was on the right track for short form content. <laughs> and uh, so we put those out like a bunch of times a week. And then we'd have the, mid the sketches in the middle that would just be like the core humor of the channel. And then the meat of the channel, which would be the episodic, uh, web shows that they were trying to push onto Amazon because when you have multiple shows, it doesn't matter which one you're focusing the most on. They're always going to watch the shortest because mm -hmm. if you're a new channel, they're going to go, all right, what's your highlights? What's, what's the small things? Am I, what am I not going to waste my time on? So we, cre I created playlists that people would binge like the 45 second videos and just gain momentum that carried over to our other channel. And over the course of six months, we went from a channel getting a thousand views a week to uh we accumulated about six eight million views and we got to use that and then launch an amazon pilot and i got a good uh producer credit for that 
I got to help with some writing stuff. And then I uh, was a background actor uh, for a few things and uh, wish I did better job on that because I was dead tired. Okay. <laughs> They're like, just act. I'm like, I have no sleep, but I am here because you said <laughs> I could be on TV. <laughs> so Jeff, what are you focused on right now? Uh, so I'm taking a step back technically from a lot of ongoing projects or new projects, really. I'm shifting that over to my business partner, Lee, to grow because uh, we started a company together because we're a bit yin and yang. And that's not just because he's Asian and I'm white. <laughs> it's because I do all the organic stuff and that's what I'm, I'm good at. He does the ads and he's good at that. We, we basically do what each other hates. Mm. And so we're, we're able to clearly uh, divvy up what type of markets we're looking for. And ideally, each client will need both of them in the long run. It's just you don't know which one they're going to start with. Some companies are more e-commerce based and it's better for them to run ads to get the initial cash flow and attention and then optimize and build from there. Other companies have no visibility, don't even know where to begin with their ads. So they would have to invest in SEO, get the site data, use that keyword data coming in to know what ads they can use and save them money. So I'm technically not taking anything because my new position at uh, Comcast is me basically building data pipelines to fix the incoming analytics, to give context to what's coming in and how to take that demographic data go to sponsors and get large term deals or and when, shows. when you say NBC Comcast Universal, you mean the NBC Comcast Universal, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, that's the parent company. That's what it says on the business card and the emails I get. The direct, the, the direct avenue I'm on is a G4 TV. It's a gaming digital news network. We're on Pluto TV, a lot, a lot of simulcasts, YouTube, Twitch, all this stuff. And I'm basically brought in to uh, help the current team do what they're doing for TV, but translate it into a formula that works for YouTube and then how to optimize those channels, get them as far as possible so we can get larger sponsorships and network deals and then fund shows by YouTubers to build this collective. And uh, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. It is very interesting, but I'm down. And I just know that for the first like three to six months, it's going to take over my life. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, so that's why like I'm helping out friends i let go a few uh a good amount of clients that are just shit clients so to speak maybe i wouldn't call them that publicly i would say frustrating frustrating they mean very well but at a certain point i'm like i can't be doing this on a special mm -hmm. rate anymore it's not worth it. it's gonna be it's costing my sanity at that point in my free time and uh i take on people personally that i care about except not not for the next like three six months <laughs> But I do consultation calls every now and then. I'll do free ones. And then I will always refer to them to my business partner, Lee, who can help out with either the ad space. And I still answer all the SEO questions. We just brought on a few, uh, few uh, employees that can handle all the SEO delegation work. And they're pretty talented. So I just have to like look at the reports and see if anything's wrong. So I can give my dedication to G4 TV and then make sure my business partner is still growing and being taken mm -hmm. care of. And that machine is still running while well, I'm able to give all my attention to G4. What's the future hold for you? What do you see, your, what do you see yourself being like in the field, like, like maybe VP of marketing for some big agency, like being like a brand name for marketing SEO in the future? Or what's the future for Josh? A perfect world is if I solve this issue on how to translate traditional uh, TV media and showrunner format to YouTube shows. I basically got the keys to the kingdom because with that, the, with that level of executive marketing and network connections, I can do my shows too. So now my TV writing, it all came full circle. I'm a writer now <laughs> and I control the TV. <laughs> so Josh, you know, you gotta have a lot going on. How do you do your schedules every day? Like what's your plan? Like you have a calendar, you wing it, like how you stay organized and prioritize the things you gotta stay focused on. For me, uh, you always got to prioritize like some flexibility and mental health because there's some days where you just can't you just you can't doesn't mean you take the day off but you just means you gotta you gotta be able to move some things around i have days that are dedicated to certain tasks specifically and different mindsets but um i work off a lot of calendars i i have a pretty structured schedule but give some leeway if i need to move something or if i woke up late because for me just to keep my sanity and keep everything moving forward. I got to have my morning routine. 
I like to wake up early. I'll go for my run, make some breakfast, I'll journal, I'll read, maybe I'll write, I'll do it's just something to jumpstart my day. That routine's important to me. And then I jump into calls and I jump into meetings and I'm doing all my actionable goals as I can. And then, uh, then in the afternoon, it tends to be a little more free play because if I finished all my important tasks in the first half of the day, I get to take the rest of the day as is, maybe clock out early if I'm lucky, or push the meetings back or take unexpected calls. And uh, it's really just dividing up the week because Mondays, I know a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs and they always stress they don't get enough done Mondays. And I used to be like that all the time. But I, I, I tell them like, Monday is a planning day. It might take the whole day to spread out and organize your entire week because you might be calling people, calling clients, doing cold calls, scheduling meetings, who knows? Monday, you're not expected to get everything done. Tuesday is your first real work day, probably the one that's going to bring in the money. Number one, Monday is just setting up the setting up the week. Do, do you work seven days a week? Or you take days off during oh, the I week. Oh, I take days off. Uh, I'm not sure if with this new job I'll be able to, but um, I I usually work half days on Fridays because Saturday, uh, because I don't really get a Friday night or like not a wild Friday night. I'll go out and grab a drink or something or just chill. But Saturday mornings are all YouTube days because that's one of the most popular YouTube mm -hmm. uploads. So I'm managing a lot of channel releases. So Saturday nights are my Friday nights when I get to. Uh, Sundays are also completely off. So Josh, uh, you talk about you know, wellness, mental health. How do you take care of yourself? Well, it's writing and journaling is important to me, especially my morning run, whether it be music or you just kind of talk out loud and just kind of figure out what's going through the day, what's in your head, what's with some priorities. Sometimes just giving verbal statements help. Um, but uh, I, other than that, I break things into actionable goals. I have to-do lists and that's my priority for the day. And if I get everything that I need to get done that day, and even the small things, I'm not gonna stress about it. I, I can walk away, relax and go, I planned out my week. I know what I accomplished today. It fits within the schedule. If I really wanna get ahead, I'll do some more. Josh, what advice do you have for people like who want to break into marketing or SEO, like never done before, but they're interested in becoming a marketer or SEO for a career? Be very wary of what you spend your money on. Everything you can do about SEO is for free. I guess the only immediate paid thing I would say is Yoast Premium. That's a WordPress plugin. That's pretty helpful for people just beginning, but honestly, just Google SEO tips, how to get into SEO. What is SEO? And if you did real really read the first page of Google on all of those, you're going to have a very firm understanding. Then the next would be to start your own blog. You don't need to pay for a website. I like to own my websites. So the best thing is always going to GoDaddy because uh, they have the best customer support and the best coupons. So it's really good. So you can get a WordPress hosting for a month. Just get the basic plan. Find with their coupons. That gives you like basically 80 bucks off for the year. And you can start a website that's fully hosted with a free domain for probably 20 bucks. What's your advice to them to find their first client? Uh, don't start with a family member, start with a family friend or somewhere in your network and create a plan that you can actually have some actual goals there and some, some basic metrics. Don't, you're not gonna oversell them that saying, hey, I'm gonna get you double the amount of visitors or anything. I'm like, no, no, identify the problems that they're having and it even could be a local local shop that you like, whether you're going to work for them for free just to get the experience and stuff. Because I know a lot of people are like, I don't want to work for free. I can't do that. I'm like, yeah, but sometimes you have to. <laughs> it sucks. But like, if, if you're going to work for free, at least do it for a company that you're excited about. Like if there's a local restaurant near you, like I love this little Chinese place back home. I would love to give them a free website, do all that type of stuff, especially if I was just starting out. But uh, they don't really care. But you know, if you're gonna end up doing something for free, come into the mindset that you're gonna offer it for free for something that needs help, or something that's invested in, or a family, friends, business, something like that. Um, if not, get your own site and just start playing with blogs. Start to learn how to optimize your own blogs, optimize your own pages, and just see how the layout and structure works for SEO, and track your own analytics, and then. Uh, even if these, these family friends or these people you know won't give you the business, ask if you can see the analytics and offer suggestions because you just need case studies, essentially. That's what you're going to be building up. 
Josh, is anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? I don't know. I could talk forever. What, what, <laughs> what else you want to talk about? What else is on your mind? Let's see. We did YouTube, uh, Search Console, I covered with the indexing rights. I don't know. How long has it been? Like two and a half hours. Really? Yeah. You yeah. go by fast, don't it? It does. Like, oh, people say, how do you do such a long podcast too long? And everyone goes in there. Oh, I thought we just talked 20 minutes. Yeah, I could keep going. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. But we can't make it too long for everyone. Else. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, so I understand you have a gift for our listeners. Oh, yeah. Uh, so even though I'm transitioning to more of a corporate lead right now, I'm still able to take free consultation calls for any businesses that have SEO or PPC questions. We are working with a lot of businesses that are recovering from the pandemic or just trying to get back on their feet or inspired to start their own. And, you know, we, we handle all types. We've worked with uh, army vets. We've worked with the, my mentor was a veteran of national guard and that's what he specialized in. That was part of my background on that. I got restaurant backgrounds, like anything. SEO is the open world and we're here to help because a lot of people can't provide you a roadmap and we're not taking a lot of calls. So we'll probably take max 10 for like, and we'll help you out if you got it. So yeah, free consultation call with me or my friend Lee. So Josh, can you share your social media links or way people can reach out to you? Uh, yeah, you can just find me by searching my name, Josh Kotoff. I am really good at my own name, SEO. <laughs> but um, if you're on Instagram, just Mr. Sci-Fi Guy. That's pretty much my handle for everything. And uh, I get a lot of stuff through Instagram. I used to Snapchat, but a lot of people talk on Instagram. Same with Twitter. It's the same exact handle. And that sci-fi guy is in S-C-I-F-I. Not that new branding. Not that S-Y-F-I branding they did. <laughs> they, they ruined the logo. <laughs> and to our listener, we have the links to his, uh, to his gift and his, and his uh, social media links. So you reach out to him in the show notes. Find the show notes at www.cavernishhlblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friend and be sure to um, subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cavendish experience on your favorite podcast podcast platform. So Josh, we can't end of our time. Can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Uh, just do it. <laughs> nice <laughs> there's, and there's, simple. A, there's a lot to learn, but a lot of it is free on Google. It's really hard to spread misinformation about SEO stuff. Uh, the best way is to learn it on your own by Googling, reading, not paying for it, or talk to me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time. And remember to be great every day. Happy birthday to me.